Hello friends, welcome to Helping Testers. My name is Ankita. Let me give you a brief about myself. I have 8 years of experience in functional and non-functional testing. I have been involved in different types of testing like automation, performance and manual testing. I am a certified automation and manual tester. Today we will be covering about JMeter and API testing. So I will walk you through all the topics which we will be covering during this course. So let's start. So friends we are going to start from the basics in this session. From the starting we will be covering about performance testing. What is performance testing? Why performance testing is required? And what are the different techniques of doing the performance testing? Since this session is related to API testing also, so we will go into in-depth knowledge about what is an API, what are the different types of API which are commonly there in the market, REST-based and SOAP-based APIs, and what are the popular HTTP commands like GET, PUT, POST, DELETE, what is their meaning and why are they used? What are the different HTTP protocols which are used like HTTP and HTTPS? What are the different HTTP error codes and how to handle them when encountered? Moving on to JMeter, we will understand what is a JMeter, why JMeter is used and why it is so popular, what are the ways in which we can install Java because JMeter is a Java application so we need to understand to install Java also so we will be doing it from the scratch we will be installing Java and from the scratch only we will be installing JMeter. We will go through the overview of different JMeter features. Then we are going to create a script using JMeter for RESTful services and GET method. Using different examples we will go through the components of JMeter like test plan, different ways in which we can create the test plan. We will study it through an example and what is a thread group? What are the different features of thread group like setting number of threads, ramp up period, setting number of times to execute the test. We will understand all this using different kind of examples and what are the different components of thread groups. We will run live script in JMeter to understand the purpose of controllers and what are the different types of controllers which are there in the market and popularly used. Then we are going to study about popular listeners which are there in the market and again through different kind of examples we are going to see how it varies for each kind of listener what is the way in which they display the report. Then we will study about the HTTP header manager and parameterization. Using the examples of Google Maps and Google Drive API, we are going to understand about REST based API and handling the methods like authorization and then using the methods like post request, put request and delete request, how to send this request and use it in JMeter and we will understand about the SOAP API testing using JMeter again through another example of popular API. What is the difference between REST based and SOAP based API and creating a script for SOAP based API also. Moving on, we will study about different JMeter functions like 
thread num, sampler num, counter, time, UUID, machine IP and machine name. We will be using all these functions in different different areas of a JMeter script and see how they perform and how they can be used in a script. What are the areas where best they can be put. Then we can study about CSV data config again very popularly used in JMeter using CSV data config to read the data from a CSV data config file. Then going to assertions we will be covering about assertions in detail and study different examples to understand how assertions can be used in JMeter script and how they can be efficiently used to make our script efficient. Once we have studied about these different examples and through different components of JMeter, we will be going through a real time scripting experience in JMeter. We will create our own test suite using different JMeter components and then analyze this JMeter test run and see the reporting also. So we will understand how the JMeter script runs in real time and what are the different components that need to be added to a real time test suite. This will give you a end to end description about JMeter. So friends, thank you for your time in understanding the different topics of this course. I hope you like this and Let's start with the session. Hi everyone, I am Ankita. Welcome to HelpingTesters.com. So today we are going to start with introduction to performance testing. Today we will be studying about what is performance testing and why performance testing is so important. So. Performance testing basically checks the application behavior under certain load. So we need to determine that what is that value of load that the application is able to withstand. How are we going to find that value? Well, we need to test the application under different set of load, different set of users, and then we need to see the behavior that how the application is behaving. So let me give you an example here. You must have checked your result a lot of times online. What happens when you are going to check the result? A lot of time people face this issue that the application is not loading properly the people who are able to check the results early in the morning or late at the night they are able to check it successfully but those who are check it at a specific time when the number of users who are checking the result has increased at that time the application does not load properly and it causes delays and and everyone is really eager to check their results but they are not able to check it because the application itself is not loading. So this is an example of load which the application is not able to withstand. At the normal load when the load is something which the application is able to withstand at that point of time application behaves correctly. But at certain times when the number of users or the number of applicants, number of candidates who are accessing the application because the result has just been announced certainly increases. So this causes a lot of load on the application and it is not prepared for that. So that is when performance testing comes into picture. 
this shows that suppose 400 users which are accessing the application at the same time the application crashes shows that it has not been tested for these many users or even if it has been tested it has not been fixed so that the number of users that are increased are able to use that so what should we do in this cases we need to see for the application as if we are the QA then we need to ensure that it has been handled correctly we need to raise the issues accordingly and we need to make sure that the these kind of situation don't arise one more example of the cases where performance testing is failing or performance testing shows that the application is not been correctly withstanding the load is when we go to book railway tickets when we are checking the railway tickets so there are some peak times when the application does not load for example if there is a special festival like holy diwali or christmas any festival is coming up so automatically more and more users start using the application so the once the application does not load correctly so what happens is it causes a lot of anxiety in the users they do not like the fact that the application is behaving like this that they have to book the tickets and the application is not loading only or if sometimes you do the payment and your application gets stuck at that point where the payment gateway is there so you are just worried that your money will get ducted and uh, you will not get the you will not be able to book the tickets so it gives a very bad impression and most of the times we even think that we will not go uh, to this application again until and unless we don't have any other option then we will have to use this application only but if there are other options because these days markets are very much competitive so it's not that there is only one application which will be giving you that particular functionality that particular feature there are 10 or 20 and 30 other applications which will be providing the same feature and there is neck to neck competition these days so everyone is trying to make their application best so you have invested in everything you have invested in a good user interface you have made the application very much interactive uh, the functions the features are also really good so everything looks good but at the end of the day if the number of users are increasing and your application is not responding correctly at that point of time the company needs to invest a lot in the reworking hence it needs to be kept in mind that performance testing is brought into picture early in the game as we are bringing other test types of testing so just to give a summary performance testing helps us to make the application more robust it improves the speed of the application the response time the way application responds makes the application more scalable reliable and stable another important thing that we need to keep in mind when we are doing the performance test is that it should never be executed on the production environment performance tests need to be done on a separate environment usually people do it on the QA environment itself but what happens is suppose uh, if we are doing the performance testing on the QA environment then the, the QA team is not able to test properly as they face slowness because till now we have not decided on the benchmark or if we are doing 
the performance testing of the application then we need to put some load on the application to check it at different load conditions that how much load this application is able to withstand so in that case it is not advisable to do it on the environment same as the one on which we are doing the testing it is always uh, good that the performance testing environment is a separate environment and performance tests are never executed on the production environment we can do it on a replica of production some environment which is exactly copy of the production environment on that it is best to do the performance testing so friends this was about what is performance testing and why performance testing is important hope you have understood it and in the next lecture we will be discussing about the different techniques of performance testing so see you in the next lecture thanks all have a nice day hi everyone welcome back to helpingtesters.com myself ankita today we will be moving on with our session for performance testing in the last class we studied about what is performance testing and why performance testing is important today we will be covering techniques of performance testing so let's start these are the different techniques of performance testing volume testing load testing stress testing and in stress testing there is spike testing and soak testing so we will be going through these terms so that you can relate with it when we record the script you will be able to standard understand it in more detail but for now you can understand it theoretically that what is the meaning of these terms with examples so first one is the volume testing volume as the name suggest that large amount of data so when we do this type of testing then we test the application with large amount of data for example our application is working fine with one user or 10 users maximum but now i have to increase the load i need to increase the data to 10000 because there is a new client which has come up and they have huge amount of data now i need to test whether my application will be able to withstand this amount of data or not so that will be covered as part of volume testing the way i can test this is i can create some dummy data in the database and run the performance script and observe the performance observe the response time the rendering time of the application whether there is some change in the behavior or is it working like before so if there is some problem with the application if there are some areas of improvement then we will be addressing them before going to the production environment the next type of testing is load testing so load testing is large amount of users i will repeat volume testing is testing done with large amount of data and load testing is testing done with large amount of users suppose the application has 100 users and they are all concurrently launching the application at the same time so how is the application behaving at that time because for example if we are um having a test on online test at the same time all the users will be hitting the application so is the application rendering fine or it crashes 
what are the bottlenecks in the application observed are there any errors are there any bugs what kind of issues are found so all of these issues will be addressed as part of the load testing in load testing we do increase the users in different ways so it depends that for how many users we need to do testing and we will be covering these in more detail in our next sessions the next type of testing is the stress testing so you can say that stress testing is testing the application beyond its limits suppose we know that the application will run fine for 100 users and with uh, records or test data of 100 rows now stress testing would be increasing the load to suppose 1000 and increase the volume also to 1000 and then checking that what is the behavior of the application is it giving proper messages uh, to the user that the system has crashed or does it just reveal some exception from the code because error handling is also another important factor if we are displaying message to the user that sorry the application could not load at this time means that we have addressed this situation and we are working upon it but if we are going to display them the exception from the code that means that this particular situation or this amount of load has never been addressed by us and that is why we are displaying a message for unhandled situation so in stress testing we get issues like memory leaks slowness different kind of security issues and data corruption issues can be found in the stress testing let's go a bit deeper in spike testing spike as the name suggests that the ramp up in number of users is suddenly increased what is a ramp up ramp up is increasing the users which are hitting the application suddenly when all the users arrive at a point at hitting the application then that is called the ramp up period so suddenly if we increase the ramp up to 1000 from 500 then the application should not crash should not behave abruptly and soak testing would be when we do stress test on the application for a long period of time in order to check whether the system is able to sustain it or it gets slow in the display and in displaying the application then that will come as part of the soak test so as you can see that all the terms that we are talking about in the performance testing techniques the meaning or the way uh, these testing help us is very similar to their names volume load stress spike soak so they should not be difficult to remember just try to relate with the name that is being referred as and try to relate it with the performance testing terms in that way you will be able to understand it more easily so i will just give a quick recap of these terms the first one was volume testing in which we test the application with huge data to understand that when the data is increased then how application behaves and also this helps us to enhance the application for more data in future if we are aware that yes in near future we will be adding more data then in that case we will do volume testing in advance by creating some kind of dummy data and then we will be assured that yes our application will work fine for the next five years because we have already done the estimate 
for the number of users or for the number of data that will be increasing next is the load testing load testing is increasing the number of users who are hitting the application so if i have 10 users in hitting the application so i will increase it to probably 100 users then 1000 users who are hitting the application at the same time so increasing the load on the application and then checking its behavior monitoring its behavior if it is getting any kind of bottlenecks, errors, bugs, all these will be checked as part of the JMeter report. Next was stress testing. Stress testing is basically you can say that combination of volume and load. We are increasing the large number of data and we are increasing the large amount of users just to put the application under stress and to check if there are no memory leaks, the application slowness, security issues and data corruption. And in stress testing we covered spike testing and soak testing. Spike testing is increasing the load suddenly at certain points and soak testing is withstanding the application for a long period of time at a certain load to check the system's sustainability over the period of time. This will be with a slow increase of the number of users of increase of the number of data. So friends, I hope this was clear and you all are now familiar with the different testing techniques of performance testing and in near future if you come across these terms then you are able to relate to them with the labels or with their reference names we will be covering these in more detail in the future classes and you will be able to relate with them practically. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to Helping Testers, myself Ankita and today we will be continuing with our session for JMeter and API testing. In the last class we studied about what is performance testing, why performance testing is important and the different techniques of performance testing. Today we will be going through API. API is Application Programming Interface. In other words, it's a function or a method which is exposed by an application to other applications so that they can use it. An API can be public or even private. One of example of a public API is Google Maps. Google Maps APIs are exposed so that different applications can use it in their websites to show the maps. You must have noticed that if we go to some website and we want to locate the, the address for that particular website, then in contact us section they have displayed the maps. Those maps are of Google. So, they were able to include those maps in their website because Google has exposed its maps API so that any other website can use it easily. This is how the URL for the API looks like. Let me show you how it is seen on the web. So, we are going to paste the same URL and it has shown me the map. If we want to include map of any other location, then we can change the location in this particular URL. So this is how the applications also use the API. One important thing is that Google APIs are 
RESTful APIs. There are two types of APIs which are there that can be used by other applications. One is the RESTful API and the other one is SOAP. RESTful APIs are representational state transfer and SOAP is simple object access protocol. These days RESTful APIs are commonly used because SOAP APIs are a bit complex to use. RESTful APIs have, exam uh, have different kind of commands that can be used with them like GET, POST, PUT, delete all these commands are related to restful apis let's take an example to understand apis you all have you must have heard about expedia wherein we go to book for, book our flights and uh, hotels so let's go to expedia.com and look for flights So let me select the departure location and uh, line 2, any random date, and then I'm going to click on search. So when I'm sending this information, uh, when I click on search button, so what Expedia is doing is it is sent the information which I have shared for which I require the flights and then it is getting the data from multiple website, uh, from multiple airlines. Like you can see here, it has got me data from Air India. This is all the data for Air India, like different flight details. And then it has got me data from Jet Airways. You can see the price difference between Air India and Jet Airways. And also it has got me information from Vistara. For the specific dates, uh, it has chosen the best flights for me and uh, it's giving me the information now it's up to me I can compare the prices from different websites from different airlines and uh, decide which one I need to use so it makes the whole process very easy for me I need not go individually to their websites uh, for each of them and look for the rates and then I can compare it is like one location wherein I can find all the details and I can compare it makes the whole process really easy for the end user. So how uh, Expedia is able to get this information from their uh, database? How is it possible? Well this is possible because of API. These websites have exposed their data uh, for specific functions like it the one of the function could be to search the flight so for that one it has exposed the API it the public uh, the API has been made public and uh, through which we are able to see the data on Expedia every uh, API accepts some parameters so this one for example accepts the start date let me zoom it a bit for you so it has accepted the start date and end date let me copy it that will be better So if we try to study about the URL of this website, so you can see the different parameters which are going along in the URL. So the parameters like it's from Delhi 
and uh, it's flying to Mumbai. What is the departure location? What is the arrival place? How many children are there? How many adults are there? Already it has been uh, added with few parameters, additional parameters, so that the format which this uh, URL is being using so we are not concerned about the what the way it sends the information what we are talking about is that it is sending the information which we had selected in the form and same information is being sent to different APIs from where it is getting the data so uh, that's how the different APIs work and uh, once the, they receive the input from Expedia, they provide the information back to Expedia which is the different rates which we saw here. So that's how the work of API helps uh, Expedia to fetch the information from different airlines. So you can see that it makes the whole process for uh, the applications uh, really easy and it, it encourages the uh, collaboration between the applications. Otherwise Expedia needs to find the way to get the information from different airlines. Uh, or maybe it was never possible because this is if they have kept this data as private so it will not never be able to access this information from these places so uh, that's how api help us now in a, another example of this could be as we were talking about uh, the contact us section and how google maps are being used there so just uh, giving you an example of that so this is a website for uh, for pens and uh, primary uh, for uh, stationery and premium outlets so uh, if i want to find a store for this particular uh, application like for this particular company if there is a store there so it has used google maps api here you can see at the bottom also that it's from Google Maps and uh, also if we go to the DOM of this API, the HTML, so here so here you can see that uh, this is from googleapis.com so they have imported the map from Google in their own website and that is how they are able to show the location. So that's how the collaboration between the APIs takes place. It makes the whole process very easy otherwise uh, you can think that for this particular website it had to construct the map again. So that's how Google has made life easy for this particular website and lot at lot other places we are using the maps in the same manner so friends i hope uh, the concept of api is now clear to you thank you so friends let's try to understand why api testing is so important and what are the challenges that one faces when api testing is being done Whenever you are testing any API, you need to test multiple areas. Like firstly, you need to test the API itself. You need to check for its functionality and behavior that the API is working fine end to end. Second thing which we need to check is if we are integrating this API with another API, then with integration, how are the two APIs working? Are the functions compatible with each other? Whatever is being sent by API 1 is being absorbed correctly by the other API or not? So that's why we need to check the integration between 
these two APIs. And thirdly, what we need to check is suppose the API is being used by any application. So the behavior of API 2 with application. So we need to check in end-to-end -end flow that how this whole API works. So that means the integration testing of APIs are very important. If suppose any API like here for example the API 1 is not correctly tested then what will happen is that it will impact the integration of API 1 with API 2. It will impact this integration and also eventually it will impact the API 2 with the integration of application. So you can see here that there are multiple areas, applications and business which will get impacted if one API is not working correctly. So let us try to understand with the example of Expedia which we took earlier. So in this as we discussed that Expedia is fetching the information from different airlines through the APIs. Now for example if the API of Jet Airways stops working or it is displaying incorrect data. Then now since Expedia is using Jet Airways API, so the information which will be displayed on its website will be incorrect. So that will impact the brand value of not, not only Jet Airways, but it will impact the brand value of Expedia itself. People will not trust for the data which is being shown here on the website. So hence it impacts a chain of users. It's not impacting only one user which is Jet Airways here, but it will impact Jet Airways as well as Expedia. So and uh, it's very important to check the APIs thoroughly so that uh, all the other uh, APIs which are using that is also using the correct data. And further on if someone tries to use the API for Expedia then they will also get impacted if something is missing here on its website. So friends I hope it is now clear to all of you that why uh, API testing is so important. Thank you. Let's take a look at what these commands are like. Get. Get command is used to retrieve a document or a specified information from a particular URL. The way we fetch the information from Google Maps, this will be example of get command. The second is POST. POST is used to send data to the server. Basically when you submit HTML forms to transmit the data to the server, that command is a POST command. Let me give you an example of POST. I am opening Facebook. So suppose I am a new user and I want to sign up for Facebook. So I will enter my name, uh, email ID. So the main purpose here is not to register account with Facebook but to show you how the application sends post command. For this we will do a right click and click on inspect and then go to network tab. So when we did www.facebook.com at that time you can see the method is get. Now I will just click on the birthday
any random so once this is done we will click on the button create account when I will click on this button then what the application will do is it will take all the inputs from this form and post it to its server so let's see here you can see that this is the post method which the application has sent and in the params if we see it has all the data which we had filled in the form on the application so this is all the information which we had filled now when this particular form was posted on the application then the application returns different kind of errors so these are few error codes which you can see we will be talking about the HTTP error codes just in the next section so I hope get and post commands are clear by now I will repeat that get command is used to retrieve the information from a URL and post command is used to send the data to the server in form of for example HTML forms that we need to transfer data to the server so moving on to the HTTP commands so till now we have covered get post another HTTP with command which is very popular is put so put is used to send the data to the server and it replaces the page with specified data adding a new doc or file to web server or update any existing document is done using put command and delete as the name suggests that delete is used to delete any content on the uh, specific website then we need to send the delete command so we have studied HTTP commands and as we were discussing that the APIs are of two types one is RESTful and the another one is SOAP based so RESTful APIs is something which we discussed now which has different HTTP commands get, put, post, delete etc and SOAP APIs or SOAP uh, APIs are in commonly used uh, in the form of XML so that is why SOAP are not now used that frequently but existing uh, functionalities are still using SOAP because the communication for SOAP is a bit complex it is not as easily understood by a layman as we are able to understand the RESTful API commands next is HTTP protocol HTTP protocols are of two types one is HTTP and the another one is HTTPS which you are commonly using whenever we launch any website then it is either of HTTP type or it is of HTTPS so HTTP is the protocol for transferring the files like text graphic images sound video etc it runs on the top of TCP IP sets of protocols so HTTP is something which we all are familiar with whenever we launch any application it is running on the HTTP protocol another 
protocol which is an extension of HTTP is HTTPS where S is like adding a security layer to the communication. So if you come across any website which is HTTPS that means there is a layer of SSL protocol added to that particular application. While running the performance test we will need this HTTP and HTTPS specification for running the test. So we need to make sure that either the APIs or the web application uh, testing that we are doing then what kind of protocol they are using otherwise we will get error. Moving on to HTTP error codes. So there are different kind of error codes there is a huge list of error codes that you will find on the internet but here we will be discussing few of those http error codes which you can face very frequently while recording the script for jmeter or while doing the performance testing you can face these error codes so they will come in handy if you already know the error code what it signifies what it stands for then it will become easy for you to debug and fix the kind of issue which is faced so these are the different http error codes that you will commonly encounter first one is http 401 which is unauthorized access this usually comes when you are not provided access to a website and you are trying to launch that URL. In that case, you will get unauthorized access. The next one is HTTP 400. If the URL which we are sending for the request is corrupted or if there is a parameter in the request which has expected but it is not sent in the URL, in that case, we are going to get HTTP 400 error HTTP 403 comes when the access to a website is forbidden and we are still trying to access it this is different from 401 because 401 is that you are not authorized to access a website once you are given the authorization then you will be able to access it it's something which happens when in offices we want a particular website to be ac given access to only those people who are authorized to work in the project then we will give access to only those employees for others 401 or unauthorized access will be given forbidden access is something which you can face uh, when uh, we don't want the website like facebook or gmail and yahoo mail to be accessed by the employees in some companies so they restrict that particular website usage for example youtube is another example where which is forbidden to be used in the companies so in that case you will get 403 error the next one is http 404 so if I have hosted a website at a URL but later on I changed the URL and I moved the website to another website location then in that case I will get HTTP 404 that the site is not found or the requested resource does not exist then another is HTTP 500 which is internal server error it is an error which is returned by the server that something is wrong with the website so we will be going through these errors when we record the script we will be facing uh, these kind of http error codes and there might be some other which we will come across and uh, once we face them we can relate to what is the error which they are trying to symbolize all right
so friends we are done with today's class we have discussed about what is an api what are the http commands uh, which are the http protocols and what are the http error codes in the next class we will be discussing about jmeter what is jmeter and why we use jmeter and also we will start with the installation of jmeter and java so see you in the next class thank you hi everyone today we will be discussing about jmeter so what is jmeter apache jmeter is an open source application it is based on java and what jmeter helps us to do is it helps us to simulate the behavior of real time traffic by that i mean that if we want to test the performance of the application then we want to see that when multiple users are using the application then how the system behaves so one option for that is if we have want to test with 100 users we have 100 100 number of uh, users actually using the application 100 testers so that will uh, that will cost a lot to the company so jmeter helps us to reduce this cost and we can mimic the exactly same behavior that when 100 users are using the application by jmeter we can simulate these users and we can see the behavior the response time of the application the cpu use utilization of the servers so all these features are possible using jmeter let's try to understand it using a small diagram okay so this is our client which is the jmeter client and this is these are the jmeter servers so when we create the request we are doing it on the client and when we run our test so it is like sending the request to different jmeter servers there are four servers which i have made here but we can have more servers also in case of jmeter so jmeter sends the request from this client to all these servers and from all these servers we have the request being sent on the real application which we are going to test so when this process takes place so we are able to using the jmeter report itself we are able to see how the application behaved when the request was received from different servers or even if we want to send multiple requests from the same server we can do that so all these things are possible using jmeter so i hope uh, jmeter what is jmeter is clear to all of you in the next class we will be discussing why we opt for this tool and why other tools are not uh, that popular as compared to jmeter thank you hi everyone myself ankita welcome to helping testers so in the last class we discussed about what is jmeter what is the architecture of jmeter and today we will be discussing about why jmeter is so popular so let's look at the key advantages of this tool so number 1 which we already discussed that it is a open source tool by open source we mean that we need not pay for the license of jmeter tool and we can simply download it from the internet and it will be ready to use next one is as jmeter is based on java so it is independent of the platform that means we can run it on multiple 
operating systems like Mac, Windows, Linux. So it is not stick to one environment, one OS. Third one is that no programming skills are required for using JMeter. If you will start to use it, if you start to script it, we need not need any programming skills. That is not a mandatory thing for using this tool. You can start to use it by simply recording the script for the APIs and uh, start to test it. So it is not mandatory to use any kind of programming language, which is the case with many other tools. Also, since we will be doing the API testing using this tool, so we need to do the API testing for different protocols like HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SOAP. So we need not use different tools for doing this. We can do this using the same tool, which is our JMeter. So it supports all the different to uh, all the different protocols. So we will be covering the performance testing for the APIs, but we can also do the testing of web-based application also using this tool. We can simulate the number of users for the APIs that how many users are using it and that simulation uh, can be recorded and response time for the same is visualized using the reports. Reports are also another important uh, factor because if you have done all the recording, if you have done all the scripting and you are not able to see the report only, then all your efforts are gone waste. But with JMeter, that is not the case because once we have completed the test for the APIs, we can see that how, what was the response of the API, what was the behavior of the system and how many users were able to successfully launch the API. So all these, uh, Inter all these visually uh, interactive reports are generated through JMeter. It provides us support of tools like AND and uh, we can customize our own reports using the JTL files. So these files are really very helpful. We also created a dashboard for the reporting and uh, using these tools it was giving a really good view of the test run which was executed so it's an add-on and it is for customizing your reports which are generated by jmeter itself although the reports which are through jmeter which we will be covering in they are also uh, the reporting is good but if you want to take it to another level you can do it using these J JTL files and the AND tools which are provided by it. Now as JMeter uses Java it is a 100% application which is based on Java so multi-threading that is launching multiple threads at the same time is also which is supported by this tool. So if we want to concurrent, uh, concurrently launch the users hitting the API, so that we can do using this. And uh, if multiple users are hitting the API, then what is the behavior like? Because that is the case where most of the time the system crashes. Uh, because if we are doing a step load, uh, that it means if we are incrementing the load after some time if some new user is coming that is something which is still handled but but if we are doing a concurrent load at that time the application becomes a bit unstable so but that is something which we need to handle that is a case which needs to be handled so we can achieve it uh, because of the multi-threading feature also 
in the last lecture we discussed about distributed uh, in the last lecture we discussed about uh, client sending the request to different jmeter servers let me show you so client sending the request to different jmeter servers so this is a example of distributed load testing which we can do using jmeter basically what is happening here is the there is one client and these are different machines because whenever we are uh, putting the load through the system so it consumes a lot of memory from the system so because of this what happens is that uh, we are not able to put a lot of load on the system because as soon as we try to put more load in the application it crashes so the way we can achieve it is using distributed load so that if we want to increase the load from suppose 10000 users to 50000 users or even above that then we can split the load between different servers we can put 10000 from each of the server we can add one more server here and in that way we will be able to uh, simulate the number of users on the real application and the api so all these things are possible using jmeter So distributed load testing is another very important uh, feature which is given by JMeter to the users. And this helps us to mimic the real time traffic because in reality we need to find out that what number of users will be using the application based on the usage uh, we can uh, structure our performance test and uh, we can just mimic the same thing from the tool so friends i hope that you are clear about the different uh, vast variety of features which are followed which are given to us by jmeter and uh, that will help you to use it also when we start using the tool when we start to do the scripting at that time you will understand that how these uh, advantages are helpful to us thank you hi everyone welcome to helping testers my name is ankita and today we will be learning how to install java and how to install jmeter installing java is a prerequisite for installation of jmeter so we will be learning how to install java first so let's start we will be going to oracle.com and installing java kit for our system mine is a 64 bit please use the one which suits your system accordingly we'll click on the downloads okay accept the license and then click on downloads so it will ask you to save the file it will take some time for the installation but we will be learning it from the scratch so that you are able to install Java and JMeter on your own on your system so let's wait for some time till this gets installed It will be really beneficial for you if you want to do it side by side while you are going through this session then you will be able to install the Java in your computer as well if you have already installed it make sure that the version of Java is above 
5 java version 5 because that is the one that we will need be needing for jmeter so make sure that the version of the java that you are using is greater than 1.5 so that we will be able to use it with jmeter rather when we are going to do the scripting okay so it's installed now we are going to just double click and start the installation it will give me a screen to start the installation process i have launched the exe file So mine is a 64 bit so I have installed specific Java development kit based on that click on next next and wait for Java to copy the files to your system and extract the installer Okay, so it's asking you to change the destination folder, but uh, we are going to keep it here only in the C program files. It's up to you if you want to change the location, just click on browse and you can change the location to wherever you want to install the Java file. So Java comes with two packages. One is JRE, which is the Java runtime environment and another is the java development kit which is your jdk so it's going to install both of these for this link which we have used okay so it has been successfully installed so we'll just close it and do some verification that whether it has been installed successfully or not so we can just go to the location which was specified you can copy and paste the location somewhere in your notepad file so that you are able to go back to the location and check for the folder so for us the default one was C program files and this is the Java folder and it has installed both JDK and JRE successfully. Okay, so now we will go to CMD and run the command Java C. This is the command for Java compiler and it says that Java is not a internal or external command because we have not set the environment variables till now so environment variables are a set of dynamic name variables that can affect the way we communicate with different processes when we are accessing it on our computer so we'll set the environment variables you will get option of environment variables in my computer properties I am going to just straight away search here in control panel so you can go to properties and then environment variable here is the option in advanced section so just click here in environment variables we can see that there are two types of variables one is user variable and one is system variable 
so we will be changing in the user variable which is specific for the user who is using this particular system so if there are multiple users and you want it to be in set the path for all of them then you can make changes to the system variable but i will be making it in the user variable only as there is only one user so click on edit and you can see that the path for jdk is not here so what we will do is we'll add the path for jdk so that it can be reflected in the cmd as well so just go to the folder where our java was installed Let's see program files java jdk and bin so we will copy the path till bin and go back to the environment variables in path we will do semicolon and paste the job jdk path okay and close it we will relaunch the cmd folder and now we will type java c again and you can see that now it has been recognized as the command and it is giving us some information about different options that we can use so one of the option is to check the version of java that we can do so java version is 1.8 so that means our environment variables are now successfully set for installation of java for installation of jmeter we have opened jmeter apache org downloads section and it requires java 8 or later for latest version of jmeter which is 3.2 if you are using a lower version of jmeter then you are fine with the lower version of java but it needs to be greater than java 5 so we will click on the zip file as we are using windows and wait for the installation so installation is complete let's open the folder it is a zip file so we will need to extract it you can change the location i will be downloading it here in the downloads folder itself it will take some time to install so this is the file of so this is the file of jmeter so let's open it and you can go to bin here all the files related to jmeter are placed apache jmeter this is the executable jar file and we will be opening the jmeter batch file which will launch the ui for jmeter so you can see that it's uh, just opening up for us okay so we have successfully installed java as well as jmeter so installation is complete and uh, this is the ui for apache jmeter 3.2 and in the next class we will be learning more about jmeter how can we create our own script for api testing and how can we monitor the scripts which are run in jmeter so thank you hi everyone welcome to helping testers so in the last class we studied about how to install java and jmeter so today we are going to go a bit deeper into jmeter and understand its structure folder structure and also 
understand the different ways in which we can run the JMeter. So let's start. This is the Apache JMeter 3.0 folder which I have downloaded and let's look at the structure quickly. So firstly we can see the bin folder. In the bin folder basically we have all the JMeter script for starting the JMeter file like the Windows batch file which is used to double click and run the J Windows uh, version of JMeter and from the command line also if you want to run JMeter then the supporting files are here in this lip uh, in this bin folder in the docs folder we have all the doc files which are there for the GUI for JMeter and in extras folder we are going to keep all the AMP related files and the related files which are for the reporting moving on to the lib file as you know that JMeter runs on Java so these are all the supported libraries that it uses and JUnit folder for the JUnit library for JMeter and EXT folder for all the components which are used by JMeter and its protocols. So this was about uh, the JMeter folder structure. Now we know that there are two modes. The first one is the GUI mode which is the one which is most commonly used. If we double click on this batch file in bin, bin folder, so it will launch the GUI mode for us, the user interface, which has improved over that period of time. So this is how it looks like. We'll come back to this mode in a bit. Uh, let me show you how to run it from batch file as well, from the CMD as well, sorry. So I will go to command prompt and from command prompt what we will do is we will go to the folder in which we have JMeter. So bin file is the folder and then over here we will type JMeter server dot bat which is basically the name of this folder. So this is the one JMeter server batch file. So we are trying to run that. Now it says that it could not find this particular file. Okay. So it's looking for it in JMeter home file. So it is always advisable that to make sure that it is found in the first go we will set the environment variables also for JMeter. So in order to set the environment variables, we will go to environment variables uh, the way we set it in for Java in the same manner. Click on environment variables. Here we will create a new variable with the name JMeter home and the variable value will be the JMeter folder. So okay and another environment variable which we need to edit is the path one where we will add the path of the JMeter folder again. So that's all that we need to do for the JMeter variable setting. Now we will close the CMD so that the latest changes can be loaded and open it. Same steps navigating to the folder I think we'll copy it again and we'll go to the same folder and run the server again so this time you can see it was found in the first go only because now we have set the environment variables so this mode of starting the server comes into picture when we do the distributed testing using JMeter which we will be covering in another session in a separate session it will be explained in detail 
For now, we will close this version and open the JMeter from the batch file. Hello friends, today we are going to study about different components of a thread group. So let me go to my JMeter and add a thread group first. So go to test plan, click on add, threads and then thread group. So in thread group now we have different type of components. So just do a right click and in add you can see different different components which you can add in the thread group. So let me give a brief about all these components which will help you in the future lectures. So first is the logic controller. Logic controller is used to control the action of the request. So in logic controller you can see that there are so many different type of controllers. All these controllers help to control how the request will be sent to the server. So it can be that if we want that request should hit the server only once then we can use it a one type of controller. If we want that it should come and, uh, in a loop that if some certain condition is fulfilled only then the request should execute then we can use the if controller and if we want to uh, if we want the request to run alternatively then we can use interleave controller so every controller has a different feature but the main functionality of controller is to control the way the request is sent to the jmeter server okay so let's move to the next uh, component now next is config element so config element is used to add the uh, details up for the request it is like prerequisite which we do in the testing in the test cases uh, in the same way in jmeter we have config element so using config element you can add any authorization which is required for your type of uh, for your request if you want cookies and caches to be cleared then that can also be done using the config element feature if you want your request to be sent with certain type of headers then you can use HTTP uh, header manager and if you want any database connection then you can use JDBC connection so all these uh, all these actions have one thing in common that they are helping the request which you are going to send and that request to run successfully so these config elements help us in sending the request successfully and doing any preparation before the request is hitting the server before hitting the server if it needs some parameters some data from uh, different sources then we can provide it using the config element okay let's move on to the next element which is the timer so timer is used to add any sort of delay in your request so sometimes what happens is that you want a particular request to hit the server as soon as it is reached but sometimes you want that it should take some time before hitting the server because you are aware that in your flow the previous request is still executing and you don't want both the requests to hit the server at the same time so in that scenario you will wait another example of this is that for example you are aware that a particular page takes 10 seconds to load this is the expected time this is how it has been designed you are aware about it so there is no point uh, in adding the request and making sure that it hits the server in one second because we already know that it's never going to pass it is going to fail every time so uh, we are going to add a uh, a small delay in the request because this is something which is an expected delay from our side so we can use timer feature to add this delay uh, in the jmeter script timer can be of two types we can add the timer 
uh, at the parent level in that case it will be common for all the requests in the thread group or if we want we can add the timer as a part of any request as a part of any sampler which we will be covering next so as part of any sampler if we add the timer then the sampler will execute first then the time based on the time which is there in in the timer which we have specified so whatever time is specified in the timer the sampler will execute after that time okay so let's move on to the preprocessors now preprocessors are used for another uh, preparation for the request as it is it's in the name itself that it says preprocessor pre means before the request and processor means that executing the request so if we need any suppose user parameters which uh, which are required for the request so those user parameters can be passed as part of the preprocessors we can add this as part of this and uh, that will help the request to fetch the uh, user name or uh, any other suppose any ID which you are planning to pass for a particular request then that can be done using the preprocessor and that can be specific to a particular sampler as well rather than being at the top level it can be specific for a particular request as well okay so let's move on to our next element in the thread group which is the sampler so sampler uh, are mainly the HTTP request or Java request any type of request which we are sending to the server through JMeter uh, is using the sampler so sampler is responsible for constructing the request with the help of other elements and then based on that it will hit the JMeter server we will get the response back uh, from the JMeter server and this is how the process goes for simulation so simulation of the number of users and uh, what will be the uh, actions that will be performed by the user on the particular website or on the APIs uh, that will be done using the sampler so HTTP request is being used for APIs wherein we have a uh, uh, we can send rest based API as well as SOAP based API request using JMeter we can simulate the actions which are done by the APIs uh, to the another API or to the JMeter server alright so let's move on to the next uh, kind of processor which is the post processor so we just studied about preprocessor which is for uh, the request bef uh, for uh, sending the request and uh, any preparation which is needed before the request that is done for the preprocessor and post processor is that if we want any information from the re uh, from the response which we have uh, got then we can do using the post processor usually we use uh, regex very frequently here so what it helps us that suppose we have one we have two requests and uh, the response of the first request needs to be sent to the second request so that is done using regex and we will uh, get the response we will study the response and using the regular expression extractor we will extract uh, some response uh, the format and put it in the next request so this is very frequently used and we are we uh, can use it in different different ways and it is very helpful for us also okay so next moving on uh, we have the assertion so when we have sent the request we have got the response back now we need to validate that whatever response we have got is correct or not so in order to validate that response we need assertions so assertion help us to uh, validate the information which we have got in the response because we cannot be uh, 
present always to validate each and every response and when we have uh, 10,000 or 50,000 requests running at that time we cannot uh, sit manually and study all requests and uh, check that whether we have got the right response from the server or not so in that case we use assertions so assertion help us in that manner now let's move on to the next component which is the listener so listener is basically showing us it is the visual uh, visual of all the requests which are being sent and the response what we are getting through different different type of listeners they are helpful in giving us a good report and visualizing the uh, actions which are taking place between the server and the client so this helps us to analyze the report and report any issues which are there in the application usually assertions and listeners they consume a lot of memory of jmeter so a uh, lot of listeners and assertions should not be added only one or two need to be added and they can be changed based on different uh, scenarios or different number of users which we are using in the application so friends, I hope uh, the components which we have studied today for thread groups, the uh, brief idea about each and every component is now clear to you and uh, you can relate with them whenever we use them in the upcoming lectures. Thank you so much. Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about creating a script for REST API using jmeter as you all are aware that restful api which is the full form is rest representational state transfer api are the most commonly used apis in today's world it is because of the simplicity that it offers and different kind of methods like get post put delete that these APIs are becoming so popular. So without further ado, let's start to create the script. So we will be creating the script for Google Maps API today. We will take one example and try to understand the different components of the JMeter and how the request and the response works end to end from the uh, RESTful API. And then in the further sections, we will be discussing about each and every method of REST. So let me open Google first. And in Google, just type Google Maps API. Okay, so in Google when you type about this Google Maps API, then click on this link Google Maps API, uh, Google developers. Basically, we are looking to find a public API from the Google's website. So let's see which one we can use today. Okay, so we can use this one Google Places API web service. Just click on this. Once you click on it, it will give you the details like the URL which is required uh, for sending the information to the API and also fetching the information. And this is the response uh, which you will be getting by hitting the API. So you can just validate that is this the data that you are looking for uh, then only it will make sense to use this API if you are looking for a different data then you need to use a different API so this data is in the JSON format which is JavaScript notation it is a format to display the information in a easier manner so that everyone can understand it and as you can see it is a tree like structure here 
So you can see that it is giving information about the geographic location and uh, the photo references uh, for the photographs on Google and uh, other information about the locations, the latitude and the longitudes. So all these information related to the Google Maps is displayed here. So yeah, we will be using this API. Now, as you can see that the, in the URL, it says uh, a word like your API key, which is highlighted also. So what does it mean? That it is like a variable which we need to fill up here. Then only we will be able to use the Google Maps API because everything uh, everything else is in black color but only this portion is highlighted so we need to fill this information we need to fill this key only then we will be you able to use the URL so if you go up you can see that there is an option called get a key so let's click on that I will just create a new project and I will say the REST API example and we will click on create and enable API so it will take a moment okay so now we have got the API key so just to copy this API key and keep it in your notepad folder so this is how we have kept it and now open your Google Maps again and you can see that this is the URL uh, which is there for the Google Maps so copy this URL and paste this also now in the case of your API key we are going to place the above API key which we just fetched so we'll just remove it and paste it now we are going to copy all of this URL here and open Google In a new tab, we can just enter the whole URL and click. So now you can see that this is the same data which we were fetching from Google Maps API uh, from the Google Places. You, basically, this is the same response which we have got as it was mentioned on the website. So that means that our uh, API key is correct and we have got valid data so this URL is now fine and it can be used in the JMeter script so let's go back to the JMeter and see how we can use uh, the JMeter to fetch the same data and then we can do a performance testing for the same API okay so let me just open JMeter okay so this is a new test plan which we are going to create now so in the test plan first thing that we are going to add is the thread group we will just leave the values as it is for now and in the thread group we are going to add sampler so this is a HTTP request so we are going to add the request for HTTP In the HTTP request, we are going to place the uh, values which we fetched from the Google Maps API. So let's study this request a bit. In the HTTP request, we are going to add first of all the protocol. So let's see what is the protocol for the API which we used. It is HTTPS. As you can see here, it's mentioned that it is HTTPS. So I will put HTTPS here. Then in the server name, we are going to put 
maps.googleapis.com and in the path we are going to put everything which is there till the end so copy it and paste it here with the api key that's all we need to do uh, to fetch the data from google maps api we don't need to put anything in the body data or the parameters for now we can just paste the whole url here and it will post the request for us now in order to see the request what it gets the in from the uh, google maps website like what it gets in response we need to add a listener so i will just add a listener here we can use view results tree i'm moving uh, the listener as part of the test plan now uh, let's try to run it let's save it let me stop and run it again i think we already uh, stopped it that's why it's giving us this error so let's run it again okay so we have got a success now so as you can see uh, in the listener we are going to see each and everything now that this is the detail of the sampler and the response which we have got is okay and uh, then we can see in the request this is the request url which has which has been posted by us let me zoom it a bit for you so that you can see it clearly so this is the url this url matches with the url which we had set here in the google maps api now in the response in the response we should get the same data as we are getting from the url when we are hitting it in the browser so you can see that the data is exactly same right we are getting the same information because we have not made any change in the request as yet so this api gives us a success so this is about the flow of the get uh, command using restful api now we can add a controller also to control the flow of the request so we can go to thread group add controller so we are going to add a simple controller and put it on top of the request and let's make this request a child of the controller so now you can see the flow in this manner that firstly we have the test plan then we have thread group and then we have the simple controller and in which we have placed the http request if we want to change the name also that also we can do for the test plan we can keep the name which is a friendly name so we can keep maps api and in thread group we can put maps api thread group so that we can relate with what is the name of each of the field this is the controller and this is the get request for maps api
So if we want to add, we can add more request to this particular controller. We can just go to different field for the sampler and we can add the HTTP request, another request which could be a post request for maps API. So then in that, ma uh, in that manner we will have get method also and post method also and for all of them we can view the results over here in the view results tree. We will be studying all these components in detail in the upcoming lectures. So just uh, understand the structure for now that this is the test plan and then we have the added the thread group and then we have added the controller and in the controller we have added the request for the Google Maps API. So uh, if we want to run this request for multiple users then we can increase the number of users to, to suppose 10 and in view results tree I can clear this and run it again. So as you can see that the get request are, uh, are passing but the post request are failing because we just didn't add anything in the post request. So if I want to disable any request then just right click on that and disable it and in view results screen uh, just click on clear all again and run it again. So all the get requests are passing. Make sure that we don't run for a lot of threads here, a lot of users when we are doing the performance testing for Google Maps API. Now another important factor here is to validate the result which is done using the assertion. So we will be studying about assertions also in the upcoming lecture but I will just add a response assertion here just to give you an understanding of what it does. So in the response assertion I will uh, check for the field to test that is we are checking the response and the rule is contains because we are going to check that whether the response contains a particular text. So just go to any passing request and get some data from here which you know that will appear every time and it is not something which will change. So I will for example take this name here. Now in response assertion I will click on add and paste this data. So what it will do is it will check that the response should contain this information. So in view results tree I will just clear everything and we can add uh, get request for maps API and this is the response assertion for the same. Now in this uh, we will run the test again. Okay so our test has passed successfully that means that the response did contain this data which we fetched from the passing this test only. Now if I change the text here and make it something like my name itself and then see whether my name is going to display in the response from the Google Maps or not. So I'm clearing it again and run it. Okay so all the tests fail because the response does not contain my name. This is not something which we were expecting also that it will appear on the Google Maps API. So assertions can help us to validate the data that whether we are getting the expected result or not so that we don't need to manually check for each and every request that whether the data which is received is right or not. So friends, I hope the way in which we cre uh, create the request for a RESTful API get method is clear to you now. 
in the next lecture we will be discussing about the different components in details like we will be going through what is a test plan what is a thread group and purpose of thread group what is a controller why it is used and also we will be going through about the samplers and uh, the, which includes the http request and also the assertion different type of assertions and different type of listeners so all these will be covered in the upcoming lectures so thank you so this is how the apache jmeter is loading for us okay so this is how the jmeter looks like we have here in this side we have our test plan wherein we are going to put all the components related to one project for jmeter and over the top you can see the menu options and here you will see the errors if any so here you can see there are some errors which it is showing us so all the actions are being shown here these are the play options and this is to delete the data in the listener file so we will be using all of these in a lot of detail and uh, i will be giving you a good overview of each and every component which we are using in jmeter so let me tell you now that how we can add a test plan related to the web services So in order to do that what you need to do is you can go on file there is a option of templates so go to this option templates and in the drop down there are lot of options for creating different type of test plans and uh, we need to create one for the web services so we can pick this one building a soap web service test plan it will work for both the soap based request as well as rest based request so we will select this and click on create so as you can see it was just blank earlier we were having just two folders test plan and workbench but now we are having lot of different components here so let's see them one by one so firstly i will show you this is the test plan it's like a parent of all the components which will be added in the child so it has name any comments you want to give user defined variables these are the options for running the thread which we will be covering so this is the name of the test plan and we can name it anything like web service test plan for soap and rest okay so once we click here the name of the test plan is now changed so here you will define in the user defined variables any variable that you want to use for your test run you can define the variable here and same can be used in the test so here right now it's showing host but you can edit it suppose i'm putting the url here and we can change the url to anything and this description is optional if we want to add more variables so i will click on add and we can add another variables 
so this is just random data which I am entering as of now we will be when we are going to create the script at that time we will be adding valid data so you can add as, as many variables as you want here next is HTTP request default so in this we will be adding what will be the protocol that we are going to use so as you can see this is the variable which has been used uh, they had used host so this is how we define the variable dollar then curly bracket name of the variable and curly bracket again so that will come as the server name right now what we have done is maps.google.com and the variable name is url so we can change this to url also this is our variable port number is something which we will be doing when we are going to create the script you can add any port here like 8080 or 8181 based on the system that you are using and path so path would be like the whole URL which we are sending from that we are going to take the name of the server and rest of the path will come in the path so as you remember if we had seen for the Google Maps so in this Google Maps URL our protocol would be this HTTPS our server name will be maps.googleapis.com and our path will start from here from this slash till the end of file so that will be the whole of this will be our path this whole including the API key if you remember we fetched the API from Google Maps website so whole of this will come under the path that we are going to add here next is encoding so in encoding we type UTF-8 or whichever type of encoding is being used so that will be added as part of this field and in body data and parameters we are going to define the request parameters which we are sending and what kind of request is being created is it a SOAP request or a REST based request and depending on the request this will change for every API so in some we will be sending the whole thing here and in some the parameters will be sent in the request uh, from this field so you will get to a, a good understanding of this when we actually create the script so this is how we are going to add the parameters so you can just write any parameter Q and value for that would be suppose ABC and encode it or we want to not encode it so this is how we can add multiple variables also by clicking on it again okay so moving on in the test plan we have number of users so in number of users is basically thread group so it comes with the default thread group and you can just click on uh, this name field and add any thread group name that you want like my thread group comments are again optional so these are the different actions which we will cover in detail when we will be covering the thread group and there are different options like how many users you want to simulate and what will be the ramp up and how much time you want all the users to be using the system and how many times you want to loop that set of user so it will come as part of thread group basically thread means users so how you want the users to use your system and uh, the application which you are trying to simulate based on the test case or the test scenario which you want to test we will be changing these values let's go in the thread group we have the SOAP request so as I mentioned earlier that 
body data what goes in this is something like this this is the whole request which we are going to send so files upload is something which we are not covering uh, okay so it's not allowing us to go to the different tabs so in order to go we will have to empty this so let us do that okay so this is how we will uh, use the file upload and for the parameters again i showed you earlier that how we can add the parameters so we'll paste it again and next is the graph so this is basically listener that we have added listener is used to uh, give us the request and the response behavior and tell us that how was the report for it so it will give us all the details so let me see if this request runs because we have changed the url also so it will fail but never mind let it fail i will just show you how it is looking like so we'll change the user to one one and run it okay so we are saving it as my first test plan and it will save with the extension jmx okay so now you can see here that we sent the request for one sample and the average which it is showing is 399 the error was 100 percent because we used just random values in the url and it was not a valid request also this one was for some other url and we used for a different one so when we will be creating our known own request uh, which will be valid so in that case you will see some valid data but this is just to give you an idea that how it looks like so let's go to the graph okay so the graph is completely red because everything has failed but this is quite uh, interactive and uh, we can understand it visually it looks really good and in a glance we can see that all the requests failed if some of the requests had passed then it would have given us a nice green and red colored uh, graph over here so this is how the test plan looks like so friends in this session we covered about the different jmeter components and different components of a test plan using template in the next class we are going to study about uh, what is it like to create your own test plan this is this one was using the template so if we want to create our own that also we can do because we don't want to always follow what has been referred by the template so we will be covering that also in the next session so hope you had a good time with this session thank you hi everyone welcome back so today we are going to discuss about test plan last time we covered about how to create a test plan using a template and today we will be creating the test plan ourselves without any template so it is very easy to create a test plan ourselves also so if we don't want to follow any particular template then we can create it ourselves also if we want some limited features so that is a kind of decision that we have to take when we are creating the project that whether we want to go ahead with the existing template or we want to go ahead with one which we can create ourselves which can fulfill our needs so i will just add uh, so this is the jmeter opened up here wherein we, i have not added anything as of now you can see that there is nothing added in the test plan or in the workbench also so i will click on the test
test plan and add and there is an option of thread group so thread group as we discussed earlier also it will be covering the properties related to number of users so in thread group i will be adding a sampler and the sampler which we need for api testing is http request which we can use for soap as well as rest based services so we'll select that option and once http request is selected we will add all the data which is required based on the kind of request which we are sending it has options of all these like get post and trace delete every option is here and once the http request is added and we will be adding the details of the request here we will add a listener to this thread group so listener will give us the report basically so usually we add view results tree although it is a memory consuming listener but this is the one which gives us the details in the best manner so what we do is that when we are running the test for suppose 1 to 10 depending on the application's performance so when we are running it for less number of users we use this view results tree but uh, as the number of users increases view results tree also consumes a lot of memory so we don't prefer using view results tree when the number of users is high at that time we can add any other listener from this list so we can add either aggregate graph or view results in a table we can add multiple listeners also so just to choose any one that you like and it will be there for you so this is how we have created our own test plan so we can make the same edit uh, we can edit the fields in the same manner and it will reflect here same with the thread group and request so you can just uh, change the name of any of the field and it will start reflecting we can add multiple thread groups also in one test plan so i will just cre create one more thread group and uh, we can basically what we can do is we can copy this one as a whole so you can see that there are two thread groups i will delete this one and it is having the same set as we had in the first thread group so if you want to run both the thread groups then also we can do that and we can run this one suppose i want to run the second one so i will just right click on the first thread group and disable it so what it will do is it will disable all the actions inside this thread group and when i will run it will only run the second one so let me distinguish it and it is having the same number of listeners and requests can be edited based on the request which we want to send so the ba basic principle behind gmeter the way it works is that it will first create the request once the request is created it will send it to the server once the request reaches the server all the responses are saved for all the responses information is collected and finally the response 
is returned and this response which is returned is seen in the listener and the request which we are creating is in the test plan from test plan we go to thread group and from thread group we add the sampler and the sampler could be HTTP request so this is how we create it and then when we hit the icon for running the test this one when we hit this so it sends the request to the to the server and all the responses are saved and the information is collected and finally we get the response back in the different formats which are there as an option in the listeners so in the listener we are getting all the options of different kind of way in which we want to see our response so friends we have learned two types of test plans which we are creating uh, right now it is only specific to the API testing but as you saw that in templates there are many other type of template uh, of test plans which we can create so there are for web web based application also for the load test uh, for the database that is also there so different different type of uh, test plans template are there and we can always create our own template also just in the manner we did it so Jmeter will execute the request in the order if it was placed in the test plan so it will just take this as first and then it will go in the sequential order so it is very important that we place the request in the right manner and in the right order so that jmeter can execute it correctly and we can get the desired output from the jmeter and workbench is used when we are uh, recording for the web based application at that time if we select workbench then it will record all the scripts from uh, whatever actions we are doing it will be recorded in the workbench and uh, we can just copy the calls from workbench to any other thread group which we are using so it's basically for all the information and the one which we have selected we can put in the uh, thread group so that's how we can use the workbench also so friends uh, i hope it is uh, clear now how to create the test plans so these were all dummy test plans which we have created now in the next class we are going to study about the first component which we added which was the thread group so we will study these uh, components of thread groups in detail so that uh, when we create the script you are able to understand them in a more efficient manner. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So today we will be discussing about thread group. In the last class, we studied about what is a test plan and how to create different types of test plan like using with the templates or using with the directly from the menu options and including the different components in the test plan so today we will be discussing one of those component which is a thread group thread groups are really important uh, component because they are the ones who decide the core part of performance testing which is number of users so we discussed about performance testing that it is about testing the application under load under large number of users so those users are simulated from the thread group itself 
So the thread group needs to be included in every test plan and controllers and samplers are part of this thread group. However, listeners can be added as part of the test plan also. So we will be considering a real scenario here. In reality also, not all the users will open the application at the same time. There will be some gap in the way they are using the application. So we need to simulate the same kind of behavior. It varies from application to application. For example, if there is an application which is designed for users to take the test. So in that case, the moment the test time will start, all the users will click the start test button at the same time. So in that case, we need to simulate the threads in such a manner that all the users are hitting the application at the same time. However, another scenario could be that of Facebook. So at on Facebook, not all the users are opening their account at the same time. There may be different times based on people's interest when they get time to open it, they will open at different time. So in that case, we don't need a concurrent load, but we will need a kind of load which is varied and there is definitely not a situation where all the users are using it at the same time. Another example of, what, of it could be Amazon. On Amazon, if there is some kind of deals are there or if there is some kind of sale. So at that time, all the users will be hitting the application at the same time. And we have observed in the past also that the application is crashing at such times and it's not able to withstand the load. So all these kind of scenarios you need to keep in mind when you are designing your own thread group because that is when you will be able to understand what kind of uh, load you want to simulate, what kind of users you want to simulate and at what time. So let's start understanding the thread group. So just to give a recap, we, in, uh, we went to test plan and in the test plan we go to add threads and thread group and this is the This is the thread group that we end up with. So name is again something which you can make unique uh, based on how you want to differentiate between different kind of thread groups. Just make it any name to distinguish on different kind of thread groups. And then we'll come to the most important part which is the properties of thread group. So by default, these properties will be coming as 1-1 one, one in your system. So we need to decide for how many users you want to run the test case. So let's take an example that we want to run our application for say 20 users. And the ramp up period which we are deciding is 100. So that means we want to test the application for 20 users and 100 second mean that uh, for all the 20 users to be up in the system, it will take 100 seconds for all the users to be using the application. So how much you time will one user take? Let's try to find out. So let's write here that number of users which are there. So let's take it as T, number of users. This is the total number of users. So this will be 20. And then there will be ramp up period. So we are keeping it as R. And it is the ramp up period. So ramp up period is 100. So we need to see now how much time will one user take. So time for one user and we need to see like what is the formula for this to find out what time will one user take. It will be ramp up divided by user 
equal to total number of users. So here ramp up is 100 upon user equal to 20. So simply we are going to do simple maths and it's going to become user equal to 100 upon 20 that will come to be 5 seconds. So that means for one user it will take 5 seconds and for 20 users it will take 100 seconds. So in every 5 seconds one user will be incremented on the application. So you can understand in this manner that how much time will be taken by the user. So I hope this formula is clear to everyone. Just try to remember this when you are creating the thread groups and when you are writing how many users you want to simulate. So just let's go back. We are done with these two fields. Next is loop count. So try to understand loop count in this manner. Firstly, the count of loop count will be 1 by default. By 1 we mean that 20 users will be hitting the application and after that the test run is going to end. Now if I make it as 2, so what it will do is once 20 users have completed, they have uh, executed the test steps which we have going to give in the script, they will do the same action again. So let me explain you by this manner. So suppose our test case was just a simple test case which we are taking. Log into Facebook. Uh, enter any status and log out. Okay. So the number of users is suppose 20. Total number of users. So what will happen uh, the way JMeter will run is firstly user 1 will come. He will do all these actions. Then user 2 will come. He will do all these actions and so on. User 20 will come and repeat these actions. The way they will be coming is something which we have already discussed that they will be coming in, every user will be coming in 5 seconds, right? So, this is clear that this will, this kind of actions they will be performing. So, suppose this user is coming at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, this user will come at 10.5. Taking into example that they are coming in 5 minutes. Just try to understand in this manner. So now once these actions are completed, if we have given the loop count as 2. So what it will do is once this set is complete, after user 20, user 1 will come again and repeat these actions and this will continue to till user 20. So that means there were two batches of 20 users each. Okay. Two batches of 20 users have been executed because loop count is Okay, so that means how many users are there in the application? 2 into 20, which is your 40 users will be there in the application. So it's simple now. 20 into 2 is 40 users will be hitting the application and the order will depend 
based on other factors like the ramp up period which we have selected and how much time per user is taking to execute. So this is clear. Now we'll see that it says delay thread creation until needed. This is by default off and we are going to keep it as off only and because we have given enough time for the thread creation this comes into picture when the ramp up is really less so we want for every thread creation we want to have some kind of delay so this is introduced but we don't want any additional uh, weights so we will not include this then next option is of scheduler this is also by default comes as false as turned off and if we enable it it has options like duration and startup delay so duration and startup delay as the name suggests that duration is for how many seconds we want this whole test run for example the one which we have discussed for 20 users or we can say 40 users now so how much duration we want the whole test to run for 40 users so we can say any time like 180 seconds and in 180 seconds we will get the report no matter whether the test was completed or not completed so it will give us the report the next one is startup delay so it will delay for some time before starting the first thread but we don't need it because we have given enough startup time we have given a time of 5 seconds for every user to ramp up so we don't need these two fields then next one is start time and end time so it will be what time we want to start the test and what time we want to end the test so all these fields can be set when the test starts it checks for the start time and it will wait in every cycle that whether the end time has been reached or not if it has not been reached then it will continue else it will match the time and it will end the test there and there itself so right now we are not going to use these the, uh, scheduler fields because mostly our usage is with the thread properties but if you need to execute using the scheduler configuration then you may do so using these fields another important step when you are setting up the thread group is the action to be taken after a sampler error so suppose you have these users and for the second user you get some error uh, suppose that second user was not able to log into Facebook or when it launched the site was not responding and you just got a error so what do you need to do in case of this situation do you want to continue do you want to start the next thread loop do you want to stop the thread stop the test itself and stop the test now so these are the different options which are given to you mostly we select continue because we don't want to stop the test after it has uh, stopped for one user we don't want it to stop because we want to know the behavior for 20 users if such is the case that we don't want to continue and we want to start the next thread loop then we can select this option if we want to stop the thread then we can go ahead and do that uh, and if we want to stop the test altogether if if we have such a scenario that even if it fails for one user we don't want to see further that how is the behavior for other users because even if it is failing for second user it's a big thing so we will end the test there and there itself so these are the option for stopping the test there and there itself so all these options help us to form the simulation of users and we can do that when we are running the test we can change these options at any time but it is advisable to 
change it before the test has uh, started once the test is started you cannot change it and uh, execution is completed so for the next run you can make any changes that you want to make so friends i hope uh, the session for thread group has given you a, a idea about how to set the user count how to set the ramp up what is the scheduler information and what are the different actions to be taken after a sampler error thank you hi everyone today we are going to discuss about controllers controllers play a very important role in scripting the way their name suggests they control the whole flow of sending the request to the different servers and how the request is sent so all these actions are supported by controllers controllers in jmeter are of two types first is samplers and second is logic controllers so samplers send this request to the server and they tell the jmeter to send the request and wait for the response the order in which the request needs to be sent that is decided by the second type of controller which is logic controllers logic controllers define the logic in which we need to send the request to the servers we can modify the request the way we want the number of times we want the request to be executed through logic controllers they can change the order of the request uh, which is being sent so they control the flow of a uh, request while samplers create the request and uh, prepare them to be sent to the jmeter server so let's take a example to understand it so this is my jmeter i will go to the templates we are just creating a dummy so we will be creating it through the templates only from the templates uh, i can take let me just zoom it in okay so i have taken the one for the soap request now here let's try to study it study it a bit in the test plan class we went through this through the structure of the test plan which includes thread group this is a request again a sampler uh, these are the listeners so we are already aware about different components of a test plan now what we are going to do is in this thread group we have a sampler so just do a right click on this on the thread group and we can add the controllers from here it says logic controller so we can just pick one uh, any one to give you an idea about the controllers and we will be going through them in detail in the upcoming lectures so i am taking this one once only controller now the controller needs to be in above the request so what i am trying to say here is that first is our thread group in the thread group we have http request and this is the controller which is coming as another element so we can move around the elements in jmeter using the drag functionality so i can just drag it on top of this soap request
okay let me do one thing i will drag the request inside the controller that will be easier okay so because it was having some child elements also that is why we were not able to place the controller on top of the request but we play picked up the request and we dragged it inside the controller so that made made it a good structure so we have now thread group then we have the controller and this is the request so jmeter basically runs sequentially the way it works is when it will start the script uh, when it will start executing the script so what will happen is it will come to this test plan it will check for these variables and the defaults which are sent for the request then it will come to the thread group inside the thread group it will come to the controller and based on the type of controller it will execute this request so that is why we have placed the request inside the controller and if you remember that this request which we have placed is through a sampler only so if we want to add a new one what we need to do is in the controller itself we will do a right click add and these are the different samplers in from this sampler we can select any request so right last time we selected http request so this is how the http request looks like but uh, today we are going to just uh, execute through the template itself so i'm going to remove this http request now what is the purpose of the once only controller so what it will do is as we mentioned uh, that controller help us to control the action of the request so it will control how many times this request needs to be sent as the name suggests it will make sure that it is sent to the server only once so let's try to validate that now here i am just reducing the number of threads to two ramp up period also i am keeping as one and the loop count is two so if we had not used the controller and we only had the sampler uh, which is this http request so in that case this should have executed two into two which is four times but now let's see how many times it will execute so i will disable the aggregate graph and i will enable this uh, view results tree so that it is more clear to you um yeah so we are now going to run it okay we can save it as controller request it will save as jmx file okay so ex it executed don't worry about the failure because right now we are just focusing on the number of times the request is executing we are not validating any data here so okay now the test has completed but the request only executed twice why is that well that is because we are using once only controller it clearly specifies that the request should execute only once per thread so no matter how many times i increase this loop count i can increase it to 10 which means that it should have executed 20 times but let's see how many times it runs it runs for two again because the number of threads here is two so i hope this is clear now that this is uh, the functionality of the controller and it controls the way the request is being sent to the server no matter what we do here in the thread group the controller uh, will decide how many times it needs to be executed all right friends i hope uh, the functionality of controller is clear so this is only one type of controller as you can see here that there are so many different type of controllers and we will be covering a lot of them in the upcoming lectures uh, where you will be able to relate with them like what is the purpose of each controller 
and same is with sampler there are a lot of requests we will be focusing mainly on http request which is for sending rest based as well as soap based uh, apis so thank you hi everyone so in the last class we studied about the controllers and uh, today we are going to discuss about a listener what is a listener in jmeter script well listener as the name suggests is always uh, listening to the actions that are being taken place in the script so it records everything and then displays the results to us the results of various samples is shown through a listener it is basically uh, giving us the different kind of report the report could be in the form of a tree in the form of a table in the form of a graph or there could be a log file so these are the different ways in which a listener can show us the data so let's try to see from jmeter what kind of listeners are there and uh, there are, there will be few popular ones which will be we will be discussing today in the class so let's start so this is our uh, jmeter script in the test in the test plan we have added thread group simple controller and a http request so now we are going to add some listeners so listener can be added as part of a thread group as part of a test plan also uh, based on the requirement whether we wanted to listen to all the thread groups or we want a particular listener for a specific thread group based on that uh, we can add the listener so at whichever level we want to add it suppose i want to add it on the test plan so i will do a right click here add the listener here so we can just start with the simplest one and the one which is most commonly used is view results tree so this i have added and it has got added at the test plan level okay and if i want to move also the listener to any other level then i can just drag it and drop it at any level and now it has become the part of a thread group but i am going to keep it as a part of test plan only as of now okay so now uh, in order to run the test before that i will make the change in the threads so let's make it five threads and uh, one second is fine that means that in one second all the threads will be up and running uh, now uh, we will just run this script okay so now you can see there are five requests which have been sent so just go to any request and here you can see the details about the sampler result that the response was 200 okay and let's see the request which was sent and the url on which it hit this is the post url this is the uh, xml which we had posted these are the details about the headers and then we can see the response also that what was the response which we got by hitting this api so we have got the response detail as well so this is the format in which you will get the information in view results tree you can just go to each and every request and see the uh, data that whether you are getting the right information as output or not so also if you want to uh, publish this result in any file that also we can do using this box uh, so we can just browse here it will take us to the bin folder and i will give any name that uh, ankita results dot csv so what it will do it will create a new file with this name and it will export all the results which are being saved here so we'll do open this will say error loading because right now there is no file with this name so let's uh, clear it and run the test again 
okay the test has been executed now let us see that whether this file is created in this location so i'm just going to this location okay i can see this file ankita results being created here the size of the file is 1 kb so let us see what it has uh, loaded as the result okay so now you can see that uh, there are the results for this file whatever test we executed it has recorded that only so you can see the label as http request the response code response uh, uh, response is okay then there is thread name is there uh, the bytes per second what are the bytes which are sent uh, threads detail all threads latency idle time and connecting time so all the information related to the test run has been shared on the excel file itself basically what we mean by these term is latency for example it shows us that how much time it was taken by the first byte to uh, get the response so for the all the bytes it's 8269 and for the first byte the time taken was 261 so this time uh, which we are seeing here is in milliseconds so let's move on and this is the total time so given in milliseconds So I will just close it. We can see that the CSV was recorded successfully. Now let's go to another uh, listener here. Let's see which one to pick next. Okay, so now we can pick this one view results in a table. Uh, so let's run our script again. So what is happening is because we have given a path here, so it's identifying that we want to save this result for this test also, but uh, we are not going to do that. So I have removed the path from this location. So we will run it again. So now you can see in this the results uh, in view results in table are in a tabular format. These are the different fields which we are seeing here let's go through them one by one the first one is the sample number because total number of uh, requests which we are sending is five then this is the start time the thread group number label which would have, uh, whichever label which we have given this is the sample time so sample time is the time taken by the request or uh, the time uh, is in millisecond which we are getting here so 249 milliseconds for the request to hit the server and then to get the response from there so this is the total time which has been taken next is the status so status here is uh, green in green color because all the requests pass successfully then the size of the bytes uh, how many bytes per cent and then we have the latency latency is basically time to uh, for the first byte to get the response so as you can see that we are sending 8269 uh, bytes in the request is of this much size so the time when it sh uh, when it starts getting the response is 249 and the moment that the response is received that is the total time which we will be getting in sample time so that is the difference between sample time and latency here the count is not very high and the number of request is also uh, is one because we are hitting one request only multiple time that's why we are not in seeing any difference between latency and sample time but if we have a lot of request then in that case 
uh, if we have multiple HTTP request and we are running the loop for multiple times in that case you will see the difference between uh, latency and the sample time because uh, the time in which we will start receiving the response for the first byte will be different from the time we will get the whole response then we have connect time which is the time to connect to the server which is again in milliseconds so these are the different fields which we are seeing in the view results in table listener also uh, if we want to see that whether we are going to get a pass or a fail uh, in the status column so let's uh, try to add a assertion so i will add response assertion here uh, I will add contains so just take an idea from what we are going to what we are getting in the response and I will add some field there like British is there so you can add here okay fun is fine we can check with this one only okay so let's run it again uh, i will just clear the results and play it again so all the requests are passing i think the response assertion is also passing that's why so let's try to change this name to ankita and uh, because we are sure that this will not be there so you can see that the status has changed to failed so this is where the status comes into picture that whether the request uh, which we are sending is uh, completely passing the assertions or not so if it is not passing in that case we are going to see the failures here also in the view results tree also all the requests have failed okay so uh, these are the two listeners which we have discussed till now view results tree and view results in table out of these view results in uh, tree uh, is the one which consumes a lot of memory so it is advisable that whenever we have lot of records in that case we don't use uh, this listener and we avoid uh, using this listener we can go for uh, other listeners which we will be discussing now but for the initial test run like for 10 to 15 users it is fine to use uh, this listener okay so let's move on and uh, see another type of listener here uh, let's look at some graphical representation because we discussed that we can see the results in a tree format table format or in a graph format so uh, let's see a graphical representation this is the graphical representation which is the aggregate graph so let me change the assertion back to British here which was the expected result and in the aggregate graph we will see how the results are going to display so these are the five samples which are come up here for in the label field we have only one row because we are using only one request if there were multiple requests which we have added in the sampler then we would have seen multiple rows here so uh, that's why we are seeing only one row so let's see the different fields of this table the number one is the label so whatever label i will be providing here the same will be displayed so that we can distinguish between the request then the number of samples which we are sending this will be in relation with the thread group so thread group in thread group we have sent five uh, users that is why we are able to see five samples here then the average so it works in this way that the requests are sent to the server and based on the response which is received an average is taken for every request what is the response time and the average is taken off all of that and that is displayed in the average this is again in milliseconds then we have median 
so median is 271 it shows that half of the request uh, took 271 as the millisecond and others took more than 271 for 90% line it means 90% of the request took this much uh, time which is the again response time same for 95% uh, that 95% of the request took this much time uh, even in the case of 99% so there is not much difference between 95 and 99% then what was the minimum uh, response time which is 256 here and the maximum which was there is 382 which is in relation with this one 99% uh, line Error percentage shows that uh, none of the requests failed, all the requests passed because we are not seeing any failures, everything was good. And then the uh, requests which were sent per second is the throughput which is 4.5 per second. And then we have the received uh, kilobytes and the uh, sent kilobytes which is the uh, size of the data which is sent. So this is about uh, aggregate graph and also if we want to see uh, it in the form of a graph then we can see here that this is how it looks like. So it shows 294 and uh, which is the average here. So its average is in uh, red color that is why we are seeing all in red color and it is showing us the average so if we don't want to see the average and if we want to see the uh, this thing the 95 percent line then i will just check box this and what i will do is i will run the test again okay so test is complete now we are coming back to graph so here now we are seeing uh, 255 which is the 95 percent line data and if we want to see multiple uh, things, multiple columns which are there, uh, we want to see it in the graph. So I will just select uh, this one and this one also. So it will show me the data for all of them. So this is how it displays us. Because there is not much difference, that is why it's appearing to be in single line. So let me try to see if there is any deviation in this. Basically all of them are lying in this uh, range, 200 range. That's why we are not seeing a graph which is having uh, very much variation. But uh, yes, you can see from the numbers that yes, there is deviation. And you can plot it uh, in this manner. And this ex uh, graph can also be exported from the file name we can export this graph also so friends uh, these are the three listeners uh, which are which we have uh, covered and uh, these listeners help us to display the information in the format of graphical or tabular format or in the form of simple viewing the results in a tree structure now we will just uh, see another very popular uh, listener which is simple data writer this is the writer which takes minimum memory and it is uh, used when we have to run for a heavy load in that case we are going to use this type of listener so here we can just browse to the file which we had uh, selected earlier and uh, we can run the test again we will override the existing file okay so it's executed let's see okay so we can see all the data for uh, simple data writer is written on this file basically this type of listener is not showing anything on the GUI of JMeter but it will display the results directly in the file which helps us to save on the memory part okay so uh, thanks a lot i hope the information related to the listeners is clear to all of you in the next class we'll study about 
another topic from the JMeter and API testing. Thank you. Hi everyone. Today we are going to discuss about controllers. Controllers play a very important role in scripting. The way their name suggests, they control the whole flow of sending the request to the different servers and how the request is sent. So all these actions are supported by controllers. Controllers in JMeter are of two types. First is samplers and second is logic controllers. So samplers send this request to the server and they tell the JMeter to send the request and wait for the response. The order in which the request needs to be sent that is decided by the second type of controller which is logic controllers. Logic controllers define the logic in which we need to send the request to the servers. We can modify the request the way we want, the number of times we want the request to be executed through logic controllers. They can change the order of the request uh, which is being sent so they control the flow of a request while samplers create the request and uh, prepare them to be sent to the JMeter server. So let's take an example to understand it. So this is my JMeter. I will go to the templates. We are just creating a dummy. So we will be creating it through the templates only. From the templates, uh, I can take Let me just zoom it in. Okay, so I have taken the one for the SOAP request. Now here, let's try to study it, study it a bit. In the test plan class, we went through this, through the structure of the test plan, which includes thread group this is a request again a sampler uh, these are the listeners so we are already aware about different components of a test plan now what we are going to do is in this thread group we have a sampler so just do a right click on this on the thread group and we can add the controllers from here says logic controller so we can just pick one uh, any one to give you an idea about the controllers and we will be going through them in detail in the upcoming lectures so i am taking this one once only controller now the controller needs to be in above the request so what I'm trying to say here is that first is our thread group. In the thread group we have HTTP request and this is the controller which is coming as another element. So we can move around the elements in JMeter using the drag functionality. So I can just drag it on top of this SOAP request. Okay, let me do one thing. I will drag the request inside the controller. That will be easier. Okay, so because it was having some child elements also, that is why we were not able to place the controller on top of the request. But we play, picked up the request and we dragged it inside the controller. So that made, made it a good structure. So we have now thread group. Then we have the controller. 
and this is the request so jmeter basically runs sequentially the way it works is when it will start the script uh, when it will start executing the script so what will happen is it will come to this test plan it will check for these variables and the defaults which are sent for the request then it will come to the thread group inside the thread group it will come to the controller and based on the type of controller it will execute this request so that is why we have placed the request inside the controller and if you remember that this request which we have placed is through a sampler only so if we want to add a new one what we need to do is in the controller itself we will do a right click add and these are the different samplers in from this sampler we can select any request so right last time we selected HTTP request so this is how the HTTP request looks like but uh, today we are going to just uh, execute through the template itself so I am going to remove this HTTP request now what is the purpose of the once only controller so what it will do is as we mentioned uh, that controller help us to control the action of the request so it will control how many times this request needs to be sent as the name suggests it will make sure that it is sent to the server only once so let's try to validate that now here I am just reducing the number of threads to 2 ramp up period also I am keeping as 1 and the loop count is 2 so if we had not used the controller and we only had the sampler uh, which is this HTTP request so in that case this should have executed 2 into 2 which is 4 times but now let's see how many times it will execute so I will disable the aggregate graph and I will enable this uh, view results tree so that it is more clear to you um, yeah so we are now going to run it okay we can save it as controller request it will save as jmx file okay so ex it executed don't worry about the failure because right now we are just focusing on the number of times the request is executing we are not validating any data here so okay now the test has completed but the request only executed twice why is that well that is because we are using once only controller it clearly specifies that the request should execute only once per thread so no matter how many times I increase this loop count I can increase it to 10 which means that it should have executed 20 times but let's see how many times it runs it runs for 2 again because the number of threads here is so I hope this is clear now that this is uh, the functionality of the controller and it controls the way the request is being sent to the server no matter what we do here in the thread group the controller uh, will decide how many times it needs to be executed alright friends I hope uh, the functionality of controller is clear so this is only one type of controller as you can see here that there are so many different type of controllers and we will be covering a lot of them in the upcoming lectures uh, where you will be able to relate with them like what is the purpose of each controller and same is with sampler there are a lot of requests we will be focusing mainly on HTTP request which is for sending REST based as well as SOAP based uh, APIs. So, thank you. So, today we are going to discuss the popular logic controllers which are there in JMeter. Uh, they are loop controller, simple controller, and random controller. 
So we are going to discuss them in detail and understand the purpose of each controller. As you must be remembering that we had discussed earlier that logic controllers in JMeter are used to control the logic in which the requests are sent from JMeter to the server and then get the response back. So they basically uh, decide which request needs to go at what point of time. They decide the logic behind that. So let's try to understand them one by one using examples. To understand them one by one, I have taken the same script which we created last time for Google Maps uh, REST-based API. So this is the same script that we will be using today to understand different type of controllers. So let's dive deep in this. First of all, we have the test plan and then we have the thread group. Inside the thread group, we had added a simple controller. And in the simple controller, we have added different kind of HTTP requests. Well, what is the purpose of this simple controller? Basically, this simple controller separates the samplers and other logic controllers. So, for example, when we are in this particular thread group and we want to send the request for uh, the Google Maps, in that case, we are going to use the simple controller. But if we want to add another controller and we don't want that this particular request needs to be affected from that controller then in that case we will put uh, get request for maps api in a simple controller simple controller is nothing but it helps you to organize your samples and other logic controllers so it is not provided with any special feature uh, like in the last class, we had studied about once only controller, which makes sure that the request is sent only once. So those type of feature are not there for simple controller, but the only feature which it has is that it helps to organize the request. So we can place the request simply in the simple controller and they will uh, be organized in a such a manner that they are separated from another controller. So suppose if I now add another controller here, which is suppose once only controller and I will add the get request for maps API or you can say the post request for maps API in this controller. Let me move it here, drag and drop. Okay. So now what will happen is when the JMeter will come to uh, see which request it needs to send. So when it comes here, it will send this get request for maps API request only uh, based on the simple controller based on whatever we have specified in the thread group. And in the once only controller, what we are going to specify, it will send that request in uh, based on once only controller that is it will send the request only once so let's see it one more time uh, what i will do is i will delete this post request from here and i will add the get request again in this one and in the get request the second one which we are adding we can see once only so that we can uh, differentiate it from the other controller and here we can mention simple that means this is for simple controller and this one is for once only controller i will disable the assertion here because that is something which we already saw in the previous section uh, previous uh, lecture and uh, today we are focusing mainly on the controller so let me explain you the simple controller in detail so uh, based on this we will just make sure that we change the number of threads also so i have made it five and let's make the loop count two now let's see how many times the request gets executed 
I will play it. Now here you can see for yourself what is happening. So if you can see that the simple controller requests have gone 10 times, the one with simple because in the thread group we had specified loop count as 2 and number of threads as 5 so it went for 10 times which is 5 into 2 because there were 5 threads and loop count was 2 so it was for 10 times now the one in which we have specified once only so that went only 5 uh, five times that is again understood because uh, there are five threads so for every thread it will go only once which is the purpose of once only controller so you can see here that if we want to separate any kind of request from another controller's request then in that case we will be using simple controller because it will simplify for us the division and the organization of the request between different kind of logic uh, for which we need to send it so friends i hope a uh, simple controller is clear to you in the next class we are going to focus on the loop only controller so friends now we are going to cover another important type of controller which is the loop controller so let's see uh, how the loop controller works I have opened the same JMeter script which we used last time, the one which in which we are using the REST API example, so for Google Maps. So in that I am going to just copy the request which is the get request for maps API and put it in the thread group. I will just paste it here. So let me just copy and uh, paste it in thread group here is your sampler so again I'm going to go at the top of the thread group and add a logic controller and this time we are going to add a loop controller here is the loop controller added what I will do is in the re the request which I have for the Google Maps I will just drag it and put it inside the loop controller I'm closing the other controller so that you are able to understand it. So this is how we have the request inside the controller. Now in the loop controller as you can see there are fields which say firstly the name of the controller whatever name we want to keep suppose we can keep it as maps API and loop controller and then you can change the loop count to suppose 5 if you remember that in the thread group also we had a field which said loop count and this one already has a value suppose 2 or I can change it to any other value also so what will loop con controller do it will loop the request as many time as it is specified in the loop controller as well as in the thread group so for example if here I have specified as 5 and in the thread group it is 2 so let's see how many times the request will execute so I will change the number of threads to 1 only so that we can understand it clearly and I'm going to disable the other controllers as we already know what is the purpose of other controllers and we are going to focus in the on the loop controller in this lecture so the request is pretty much same which we had already created we are using the same one okay so i am going to clear the values in the results tree in the listener and let's play it again okay so as you can see that the request went for 10 times that is because in the loop controller I have specified it five times and in the thread group I have specified it two times so it is five into two whatever value specified in both the places now 
if there is already a value in the thread group for loop count then what is the purpose of using loop controller in a separate way it is because if for example i want to send a specific request for multiple times however i want other requests to be sent only once or twice or based on whatever loop i have set in the thread group then in that case loop controller helps us to send the request multiple times so here i can disable i can enable the simple controller and the request whichever we are sending in the simple controller will execute only twice however the request which is there in the loop controller will execute for multiple times which is 10 in this case so let us see that also i will clear everything and then rerun the request okay we are not able to see the difference because i have mentioned i have not changed the name of the get request in the uh, loop controller so let me change it to here i will change it to loop so that we know which request is running under which controller let me remove it and run it again so now you can see the difference here that the request which was there in the simple controller which is this one here let me just try to zoom it a bit for you so here you can see it that the request which was there in the simple controller which is this one that request was executed only two times because in the thread group group we have specified the loop count as two but the request which is in the loop controller that has taken into account the count of loop which is specified in the controller loop controller as well as in the thread group so that request has executed 10 times all right so friends this is the purpose of loop controller and in the next class we are going to study about one more type of controller which is the random controller thank you so friends now we are going to study about another popular logic controller which is the random controller in the last few sessions we have studied about simple controller and loop controller and today we are going to discuss about random controller so let's start so this is the same example which we have been using and now we will see how random controller will work if we add it in this particular thread group so again i'm going to the thread group just right click click on add then logic controller and here we are going to select any controller which is uh, the random controller which we are going to study but before going to random controller i would like to tell you about another controller which will make it clear for you to understand the random controller so the other controller which we'll pick is the interleave controller how it works so interleave controller works in this manner that it picks up whatever request we are placing in it alternatively let's try to understand what it means suppose i am just copying this request and pasting inside the interleave controller i will paste it twice and what we are going to do is we will name these requests differently like the first request i am putting as interleave controller one and the second one we are going to put as interleave controller two so that we can see the difference here now we will just disable the other controllers and clear the test results 
now let's see how the interleave controller works so first check the thread group in the thread group we have specified only one so let me make it four times and loop we can keep it as once only that will give us less number of requests and we will be able to understand in a better way so let's see ideally if it was some other controllers what should have happened that this these requests should have played for four times so we should see around eight records here but let's see how many we see here with the help of interleave controller okay so we are seeing only four records here Let's dig in deep here. Okay, so it has executed only the first one, first for the one thread. Let's make it two threads. Oh, the threads are four. Let's make the loop count as two. Let's see how many it executes now. okay so now you can see that in the interleave controller when i made the loop count as two then it picked up the second controllers so first the first request then second then it picked the first one again and then it picked the second one so as you can see here there are four times when it has executed for the controller one and four times only it has executed for the controller 2 but it will pick alternatively first it will pick this one controller 1 and for the second it will for the second loop it has picked the interleave controller 2 so it picks the request in a alternate fashion okay so that's how the work of interleave controller is that suppose for example you go to a website then in that case you will not access all the pages uh, every time you might go to a particular page and then you might exit and then you can go to another page like for example in facebook also so when you go for facebook you don't uh, check all the pages every time you don't post a status update every time so in that kind of scenario if you want to do the performance testing for those type of scenarios then interleave controller comes into picture so what we can do in that case is that for the first request we can do the status post taking example of facebook and for the second request we can uh, do upload of a photograph so that way is it will just alternatively execute the request in the controllers which is specified in the request so it will alternatively pick up the request in that way it can run for a different kind of load on the application rather than putting same uh, functionality or rather than putting load on the same functionality we can just put it on different different functionalities and see how the application behaves that's how interleave controller helps us so now what we are going to do is that we will try to understand the random controller with the help of interleave controller so let's start and add it here i have added random controller and i will place these two requests only here and this time i will name it as random random controller one and random controller 2 okay and we will disable the interleave just to understand the random controller first and uh, we are going to keep everything same the number of threads as 4 and loop count as 2 now let's see in the view results tree listener how many times it executes okay so now you can see that for the controller one it has executed the request five times and for the controller it has executed only three times so that is the purpose of random controller that it will randomly pick up any number of requests and run it according to itself so it will decide on its own for which request it wants to 
increase the number or and for which one it wants to decrease so it will decide on its own as we discussed the example of facebook that for how many requests it wants to do the status update and for how many requests it wants to post the photographs so i hope uh, random controller is clear to you so friends we have discussed different type of controllers like simple controller once only controller loop controller interleave controller and the last one was random controller i will be sharing this example with you so make sure that you practice it in order to understand how jmeter decides on sending the request to the server in different manners through the controllers thank you so friends today we are going to study about another important topic for jmeter and api testing which is handling the header section headers are basically passed in your website as some data which you want to send to the server along with other content they basically define the operating parameters of the transaction and also called as metadata so there are different type of headers which you will see in the application we will see in the example also how the headers look like and there are different kind of headers which are there these are some of the examples of the headers that you will see so this is the name of the header this is the description what does the header do and this is the example in which way we pass the header so for example taking into account the first one accept so it mentions the content types that are acceptable for the response and the content type which it is mentioned here is text and plain same for the character set that utf8 character set is accepted by this application then we can specify about the encoding also the languages which are accepted the cookies if we want to set any set any kind of cookie from the server then we can send that as a header in the request so this is not only in jmeter but if we send any request from the application from the world wide web that is there so if we send any request from that then also we set the headers so headers can be specific to one request or they can be different for every request also so moving on you can see that there are we can specify the content length also for the headers and the content encoded binary also can be specified as part of the headers so let's try to see in the real world how the uh, how the headers look like i have opened google and from here let's go to our site helpingtesters.com now just right click and go to inspect and in the network tab just uh, refresh the site again and you will see all the calls which are going for the website so you can see all the different calls which we are sending to the server and then we are getting a response back for those calls so we can take any uh, any request just to see what kind of headers are going in that so just let's see this one so here you can see different tabs so we are going to focus on the headers tab so in headers you can see that these are the different values which have been sent and these are the different values like accept ranges cache control cache encoding content length content type so all these values are there in the header 
so we can specify the type of content that we want and the length of the content that we are trying to send and content encoding that zip format and maximum age that for how many uh, after how many time the request will require the resource to be downloaded from the server because every time the site loads it needs some data so if the cache control is on then in that case it will not need to hit the server again and again but if it is off and it is uh, having less age then in that case it will need to request from the server again and again and cache resources will not be available after the time which is specified here so whenever we are sending the request through jmeter also then we need to send these headers along with our request so that the request is as close to the real request so let's see in jmeter how we can add the headers so i am opening our jmeter file just zoomed it in a bit now this is the same example which we have used to understand different kind of controllers so i am just adding a header to one of the request so as you can see this is the thread group then we have the controller and then we have the request now we want suppose some headers to be passed so what we are going to do is we will just right click on the controller click on add and then we are going to add the headers so it will be part of the config element here you can see the option of http header manager and we will just put it before the okay so this is the header which we are going to use so basically it needs to be before the request itself because first the header is constructed and then we are going to construct the request so what i will do is i will just remove it from here so that our header comes in the top and then we can just take this one copy it and we can just paste it here okay so i will just remove this and say it's simple controller request and this is the header so as you can see initially the header is blank header manager and the values here are blank so you can add any value just click on this add button so this area has highlighted so that we can enter the first value so we can enter like content type and value could be like for example if we are taking the example of helping testers only so we can just mention this value here application javascript but this one which we are the header in which we have added it is an api so it depends on the content type which the api is going to accept so we will use this value for the api and then we can just disable the other request to see how it looks like okay and in the thread group i will reduce it to one and let's see whether our header gets passed successfully or not so this is the request which we have sent and you can see here let me show you that in the request headers in the request we can see the header which we have sent which is content type text xml and character set utf8 it depends on different apis what header we need to pass 
this is just a random header which we have passed here and it is like something which will work for most of the uh, APIs as well as websites because we are exchanging the data in XML format which is highly acceptable and uh, we are sending the content type as text and also the character set UTF-8 this character set uh, attribute specifies the character encoding for HTML document so UTF-8 is basically preferred encoding for uh, emails and worldwide web so this is a very uh, common header which we have used here which should work for most of the uh, examples that we use but here you must have seen that we were able to get a success without the headers also so this is uh, something which is an additional data and it is valid data and that's why we got a success also here but headers come into picture if we specifically need to pass some information based on the request so for example in case when we are going to study about the soap request so for soap request also we need to pass soap action that is part of the soap headers so in that case we are going to just add a soap action here in this field we will add soap action and here we will pass the value of the soap action so i hope now the purpose of header manager and how you can use header manager is clear and uh, in the next class we are going to study about the parameterization so thank you hi friends we are going to study about parameterization in jmeter today parameterization is important because we want to make our script dynamic we don't want it to be fixed with one value and run with the same value again and again we would like it to be flexible for any change in the data so that is why parameterization is done so that we can specify the variable and assign it a value and whenever we want to use that particular value anywhere we are using the variable so that if we change at one place then we are able to ref uh, then the same value is reflected at all other places and we don't need to change the same value at every place so that is the main purpose of parameterization let's see through an example how we can do parameterization in jmeter and how it helps us to save time and make our scripts flexible and maintenance free let's see now we are using the same example which we had used for the controllers in which we have the rest api for google maps specified let's see so here you can see in the request that we have passed lot of values let me copy this whole url for you in a different tab okay so here you can see this value that key is equal to and this is the value and this is the variable again name equal to cruise now if i want to use it for a different key and if i'm using 10 requests then i need to change this at 10 other places so i don't want that i need to do it so many times and i would like to save my time so parameterization will help me to do that so what we can do here is that we can copy this key here just copy it and here you can see the tab of parameters and here is a add button so just click on this and give any name to this name and in value we are going to paste the value which we had copied from the notepad file okay so this is done 
now what we need to do is in the request we want that it should use this particular key so we are going to do in this manner we will just remove this particular key and value from here including the emphasis sign and what we are going to see in the request let's see I will just remove this for you okay so let me first copy this request below the last request which we had so as you can see in this we have not passed the key value okay let's try to send it without the key then okay so our request worked and in the request you can see that it has added the key and the value itself using the parameters which we have specified so this is way this is the way in which we can pass all the parameters and if we want to change anything in any of the parameters then instead of doing it in the URL we can do it here in the parameter section itself it will be easier for us let's see another way in which we can use the parameters so what we are going to do now is that we want that this particular key can be used in any of other calls so how can we do that we can just go to the test plan right click add and in the config element we are going to select it's at the bottom user defined variables so it has added as part of the test plan as you can see in the same level as the uh, listener was added so I will be dragging it up at the top of thread group because we need this value in the initial phase when we are checking the variables whether all the variables have the value set or not so in the user defined variables we can set any user value and uh, we can provide a key and value structure so again what we are going to do now is we will just click on add here let's name it key and the value will be same as this one so I'm just pasting this value here now what I will do is let me take another call from here and drag it uh, let me just copy it that will be better let's take this one copy and paste it okay so now we have the two request let me close other things so that it's uh, better for you to understand now in the interleave controller as you can see that the request was same and this is the key which we had used so this this key matches with this one so now instead of passing it in the parameters what we will do is we have already specified it in the user defined variables so we will be using this value now uh, let me just remove the value from here in this case we are going to keep the value of the uh, name here so I will just add after this what value we need so this user defined variables will tell us what is it so the name of the variable is key and the value is value basically here we can specify any name like I can specify my name here okay and we can use this value through this variable so I will just type the name of the variable here 
okay so if you remember in the last case where we had to use the parameters we are just passing the exact uh, key value key here and the value here so that it appends to the uh, original request in the same fashion in which we were sending it in the url so basically this part is being created through this parameter section it is adding the emphasis sign then it is using this name then equal to and then adding the value also but in the user defined variables we are just concerned about the value we are not concerned about the variable name because we are going to keep the key as it is now let's see both the request we are going to run it let's run it let's see the calls which have gone okay so in this one you can see that it appended the key the way we saw earlier and in the second one also it has passed the key and the value whatever we were checking here i will just reiterate this for you here we had changed the key the value for the key and we have changed it to a variable name so whenever it tries to send this request so it will look for this variable name and then in the user defined variables it can see that yes there is a name for it and it has a value so through this name it is going to pick up this value for it so you can see that here it has it and in the first case it will see that there is nothing after this line so it needs to append the parameters at the end so let's see to add one more parameter so that it becomes even more clear to you so i will remove one more parameters that is this one and let's add it here name and then here we are going to add cruise yeah this is better so name and cruise okay now we will see how it runs let me remove i am just disabling the second one for you so that we can see now you can see that in the request if we paste it here it's even smaller and in this we have removed two fields first is the name and second is the key this is the request which we are going to send to the server and using the parameters it will append it at the end it will add it at the end of this request so let me run it okay so this is the request which we have were sending and you can see that here it has appended it at the end after the key so it is going to do in the order in which we specify if we want to move a particular uh, variable at the top then we can just use this and it will add it in the front so you can see here now the name equal to cruise is before key so it will append keep on appending the request as we add the parameters with in the request so this is i hope clear now and the second type which we studied today is for the user defined variables and in the user defined variables we have just specified any name for the variable and given it a value and whenever we are running the request we are just using the variable name and it will automatically fetch the value for it now suppose if in future i want to use a different key so i don't need to do it in 10 other requests in all these requests i don't need to go and change the key in every request because this is something which is being used everywhere so what i can simply do is i can just replace it 
with the variable I can just do dollar sign curly braces and the variable name and it will automatically fetch it from the user defined variable because it is at the top level so it will apply for the whole of the thread group and multiple thread groups also so any thread group which is using this variable will be able to use this because this has been set on a global level if we want to set it at a uh, thread group level also then also we can do that just drag drop it inside the, any thread group and you can use it for any specific thread group also so if I want to use it for any other uh, controller then we can do that also so I'm just disabling this one and uh, we'll just see that I'm disabling the simple controller also okay so if we just change in the random controller okay so it is able to fetch for both of these controller requests although the controllers are different but as I mentioned because it is something which is set at a global level so we are able to use it across different controllers and across different requests and this is the one which is specific for a one request which is the one which we are using in this one so this will be specific to this request only so friends I hope the concept of parameterization and different ways to do the parameterization using the parameters and using the user defined variables is now clear to you I will be sharing this script so that you can practice this on your own as well thank you so much Hello friends, today we are going to study about another REST API method which is PUT method. So before studying about PUT method, we will be doing a POST also. Just to reiterate, POST method is used to upload any content or fetch information by posting any data. However, PUT is used to update the content. So what we are going to do today is we will first post some content on Google Drive and then we will edit that data using the put method. So let us start. So for the example, we are first going to open JMeter and in JMeter I will be creating a test plan. So let me go and create a new test plan. So just go to file, new, in this test plan we are going to add the thread group and inside the thread group we are going to add the controller and inside the controller I am adding the sampler which is the HTTP request here. Once we are done with this process we are going to add the header manager so we'll go to config element and in that we have the header and header manager I'm just going to paste it above this request so now we have all the elements ready here we'll add the listener later on so now uh, we need to check for the Google Maps API so let me open Google Maps for you so I will type here Google Drive API. So here you can see the option for Drive. Just click on this and you can see the different options. So let me sign in to the Drive so that we can see and let me type in the password as well so you need to sign in with your uh, credentials now let us see how we can use the API so here you can see the option for learn more about drive rest API so just click on this option 
and uh, you need to study a bit whether this API is having the function which we are looking for okay uh, yes so what we can do here is we can just see the steps which are required to use this particular API so let us just scroll down and see where we can see the option to upload any file using Google Drive so let me see here uh, okay yeah so we can just go to uh, the option here it says the core functionality of drive apps is to download and upload files so we are looking for upload functionality so let me click here and it is giving us the data that how we can do uh, the upload for the apis so basically what we are looking for here is the url which we can use to upload the file so we'll just go to create now here it says it requires authorization so let me see how we can do the authorization just open it in a new tab okay so authorization so first you can see that these are the api urls which we can use and then we need to do the authorization so for authorization you can see that there is an option to read more about authorization let us go there and see how we can do the authorization so authorization for google drive is done using the oauth so let me just click on this option of oauth and it will give you all the options of how you can generate your own authorization token so authorization token is something which we will be covering separately in another section but for now you can understand it that authorization for the google maps is required uh, sorry for the google drive is required to authorize yourself for accessing the drive so let me click here on the protocol and just see what are the protocol what is the framework that it will be following okay so these are all the information if you want to go into the detail you can refer to this file and we are basically looking for an option where we can use the api console so here you can see to obtain the google uh, auth so we can go to this option I'm just zooming it a bit for you so we can visit the Google API console so just go to this API console okay so this is the URL let me copy this URL for you so that when you are doing this particular process you can directly go to this Google Drive OAuth URL this is the URL you need to go after you sign in after you sign in to the Google Drive API you need to go to this so let me make this as step 2 and step 1 will be this URL so once you are signed in to this particular URL then you can go to this directly so need to sign in And go to this URL so let's move on and see how we can generate this particular URL in this section you will see a option for credentials so just on the dashboard go to credentials and in the credentials you can say create credentials and we are looking for OAuth client ID so let us go here and it is for jmeter it's not for any application and we will just name it as the uh, whatever name is coming there we'll just use that so here it has given us the oauth client id so go to credentials and then create credentials and there you can create credentials for other option okay friends 
so we have got the key and this is our client id and then we have the client secret so this is our client secret we'll just click on ok here so we have generated our this is the name of our OAuth client IDs. Now we need a token authorization token also. So what we are going to do is we will go to the dashboard again and uh, if we go to back to this particular option the page. So here you can see a option for OAuth to playground. So just open this playground and let me mention here go to OAuth playground once you are there in the OAuth playground here you need to search for the option of drive so I am looking for Google Drive okay I have written um, it should have option for Google Drive let me just scroll it a bit and see where we have the Google Drive option Okay, so this is the option for Drive API v3. This is the option which we need to go to. So uh, let me mention this step also that we need to go to Drive API v3. Okay, let me remove this. So when you go to this option, just select this option and you can select this one or uh, the drive one because it will give us for all the APIs and you can click on authorize APIs and I'm going to select allow okay so it has given us some authorization code here now what we need is the token so let's see how we can get so here you can see the option that exchange authorization code for tokens so what we did was we went to the drive api v3 select option for drive which is the first option and then what you need to do is click on authorize apis click authorize APIs okay so we did this step 1 and after we completed the step 2 where we got the option to uh, select the name of the email ID there you got the authorization code and then you need to exchange for tokens so select this option okay now we have got the refresh token and then we have got the access token also so this is this is our access token which we will be using in our script and you can see the token type here is bearer and this will expires in 3600 seconds so we have some time where we can use this uh, this particular token once the token is expired we won't be able to use it so we need to press refresh access token so what we need to do is we'll go to our script in the header manager click add and in add what we are going to do is we will write authorization here we will write the name of the token type which is bearer just copy this and space and then we are going to put the full token just put it here and we are good here so this is how authorization works as we added in the header manager so what it will do is when we send the request it is going to authorize that whether it is having this particular header with correct authorization value or not 
and as we saw that there was a limited time for this particular token so it will validate that whether this token is still valid or not authorization is important because it needs to certify that whether the request is being done from a valid source or an invalid source that can pose some security threats also so in order to avoid any such threats authorization is done for example if we log into our gmail account we always use some uh, login credentials that is done to authorize us only to access our account we don't want anyone to just open our account read our emails related to credit cards or some personal information and then misuse that in the same way apis also need some kind of authorization to make sure that the data which is supported by that particular api is authorized for a set of users or set of users who have the valid tokens Hello friends, today we are going to study about another important method for REST API which is the POST method. So POST is required to send some data to a particular API and get the response back from the API. It is different from GET that GET is required to get any data that some information which is already there we are just trying to get that particular information from the api but post is that for a specific value we need some data and we would like to get that information so that is done through the post method let's try to understand how we can do that to get the uh, idea about post we are using the example for global weather apis and we have just gone to this URL and there are two methods get weather and get cities by country we are using the first one get cities by country here you can see the SOAP request and response and we are going to focus on the get one so get data and post data so for get we have already studied the example of Google Maps API wherein we got the information about the geolocation so today we are going to focus about the post method using this example so as you can see that it is a HTTP post method and here what we have given is the parameter which is required for this by by this particular API so let's see what is the request like in jmeter and what is the response that we get so let me create a new test plan here again in the test plan we are going to add the thread group and in the thread group we are going to quickly add the controller inside the controller we will be adding the http request so in this version of jmeter which we are using you can pass the soap request as well as the rest request using this http request uh, sampler that is the benefit of the latest version of jmeter so we are going to pass the request using this particular sampler itself now let's see what all parameters are required by this request so go back to the page where we are uh, finding where we have the data regarding the HTTP post so the first block which we are seeing here is the request and the second block is the response so let's start with the request this is the request that we need to send so in the parameters we are going to add the country name and the value of this we can keep as India so this is the only request that we need to send and let's see what is the server name this is the server name here the name of the host there should not be any space and in the path we are going to put this path 
and it says that it is a HTTP protocol as compared to the Google Maps which was HTTPS. So we can just put HTTP here. That's all is needed for the request. Now we can see that there are a few headers which is required. So we can go to the controller and add the headers through the HTTP header manager. So let's add the headers one by one. First is the content type. So all these content types are supported by this API and then the content length. So length is in light blue color as you can see. That means that we need to change the value for length. This is not a hard text that we can put. So I am putting 1 lakh here which should include different kind of length. We want all the data. So friends this is how we have created the controller. Now we can add the listener to see the data. Let's go and add the listener here. Uh, let me add the one which is descriptive and easy to understand which is view results tree but as discussed earlier this particular listener consumes a lot of memory so if you are running it for large amount of users then try to avoid this particular listener as it will consume all the memory from your system now since we are running it only for one user Make sure that you run it for maximum 10 to 20 users because this is a public API and if you put a lot of load on this API then it might go down and we don't want it to crash. So we will just run it. Yes, saving is another important thing. So let's save it as REST API host example. and see what we have got in the request here okay this is a uh, get which we have done so let us change it to post and I will run it again that is why there was nothing in the request okay now we have the post uh, data which is the one which we have passed in the request itself and these are the request headers which are sent. This is the URL and let us see the response. Okay, so yeah, we have got the expected response as they, it is displaying us the city names. Now, in order to find out that whether the response was expected or not, we can go to this particular test harness which is there and enter the same name of country and click on invoke and yes you can see that this is the same response which we are getting here if you are confused about these signs that add ampersand lt and ampersand gt this is displayed when it is in the encoded format this is for the angular brackets so that means that the request and the response both are correct for the post request for the weather API which we have used. So friends, I hope this is now clear to you how to send a post request and how to send the parameters. The way we are passing the parameters that may be different for a different API depending on what are the requirements of that particular API for sending the parameters. But you are aware about the way in which we can send through the parameter. So you can keep on adding here any number of parameters that you need to send for your own API. Thank you. Hello friends. Today we are going to study about different ways in which you can use the Google APIs for actions like post, put, delete. So the API which we are going to discuss is Google Drive API. Firstly, what we will do is post a file on Google Drive. 
that will cover the post method then we are going to make some changes that is update the file on drive this file is the one which we have used in step 1 file used in step 1 and finally what we are going to do is delete this file same file which we have used in step 1 and 2 so these are the steps which can be done using the google drive apis which are public so the url which you need to go to to perform these actions so first which we are going to discuss is post a file on google drive so this is the url which you need to go to this is google drive's api for simple upload so let me add this uh, url for your reference now let us just go through this document and understand how we can do a simple upload using the Google Drive API. So basically what we are trying to upload is a file. So in case of simple upload, it says the file is small enough to upload again in its entirety if the connection fails. So we need to make sure that the file is not huge in case we are doing the simple upload and there is no metadata which we are going to send with this type of file if we want to send any kind of metadata then we need to use another type which is performing a multi-part upload so multi-part upload will have metadata content wherein we can add any kind of image also along with our along with our file so what we are looking at here today is simple upload we can cover multi part upload also so when you just scroll down you can see different information which is given by the google uh, developers the things which we need to keep in mind is so we need to keep in mind uh, the post URL which we are going to use. So you can see here upload type is saying, said as media. And then when you scroll down, you can see the data like what is the content type, what is the content length which you will be keep, keeping. And also they have provided a simple example for using this API. So when you want to use it, you can use this URL, uh, the content type and content length, authorization which will be covered in a separate lecture and then comes the data which we want to send. Same way for performing the multi-part, we need to use the URL. This is the URL for multi-part. So let me just copy this URL for you. This is the URL which we will be using. This is the API URL. And then you can see the step says create the body of the request. Format the body according to multi-part related content type. And this will be metadata part or media part. So the, all this information is there. And uh, once you have just gone through this information, you can straight away go to the example. That will be more clear. In the example, you can see there is a post URL, authorization is there, content type is multi-part related and boundary which we need to specify. These all things will go in the headers and this is the server name and this is the, this is the server name and this is the post URL which we will be using in our uh, request which we will be creating in the next class. So this, all these fields are clear and then the main content which we are going to send is going to come inside this so this is just a random text which you are uh, adding here and then you have to specify the content type and then the name of the file so all these steps need to be followed when we are using the google drive api and once we have followed this and if the request is fine then we will get in response the, this type of 
data with the name of the file successfully uploaded. So friends, I hope Google Drive API, uh, how to use Google Drive API is clear to us. And then in the next class, we are going to see how we can practically use it through JMeter to do a actual upload. Thank you. So now we are going to continue with creating script for Google Drive for post method and put method. So once we have set the header manager, then we come to the request. In the request, we are going to paste the content which we want the file to have. So let us copy this content which we have extracted from the Google Drive. And we have just made some changes here that the title for the file which we will be uploading. So we have mentioned uploaded by uh, your name or anything, any text. And this is the multi part. So this is another random text which I have put here. And then the content type here is application JSON and CARSET UTF-8 and the text plain content type is also mentioned which is the content type of the text which will be there in the file. So once you have put this data then you need to put the uh, protocol as HTTPS, server name as googleapis.com and method as post. Also we need the server name so server name is the file name for uploading the uh, the path name will be specified as Google Drive path. So this is the path which we have got from Google Drives. So let us just put that path and server name will be googleapis.com. So once we have this content ready, our request is ready. So let's just, just check the header managers. In the header manager, we will be adding the content type. So Yes, so in the content type, we are going to put another field, which is the multi part. And then we have the boundary mentioned as what is the boundary of the content here in the request. So as you can see, the boundary value is uh, this random text, which I have pasted. So we are going to put the same thing in the header manager. This is the content type, which we have placed. Now let us add some listener. and let's see how the request works. Let us run it. So it has given us a green signal. The request is fine and the response is also looks correct. So let us see on the Google Drive what we have got. Let us go to our Google Drive and see. So I'm just opening my drive. Okay, so here you can see that there is a new folder which has been created which says uploaded by Ankita. And if we open this file, so it says the text which we have sent in the request, which is this one. So let us do one thing and create another another and see how it looks like. Let me change the text here and make it jmeter session and uh, here we can put jmeter this is the content type let us clear it and run it again so it has given us a success let us go back to the drive and refresh the page so yes, this file which we had created jmeter session that is now visible on the drive. Earlier it was not there. So whichever text we will add, it will be shown on the drive as a file. And yes, this is the text which we were, uh, which we had put in the request. So this looks correct. So this is what post. So we have uploaded something which was not there on the drive. Now what we are going to do is we are going to edit the content of this particular file in the next session. Hello friends. So we are using now 
updating file on drive we have successfully done a post request on google drive we have uploaded a file now what we are going to do is update a file on the drive so for updating the file let's go back to google drive and see which url we can use for updating so let me copy this url for updating you need to go to this particular url and for updating you can just use the same request which we were sending in case of uh, creating the data only thing is that the name of the file can be changed so that uh, we can make out the difference that this is a different file and also what needs to be changed is the URL on which we are going to post so this is the URL which we need to post field ID or sorry file ID is something which you will see how we can fetch from the post response uh, how this file ID can be fetched that will be taken up in the next class so friends I hope the way in which we do the put which is updating and it clearly states that that we can do using jmeter also it will require authorization which is also covered as part of another lecture and you can go through the details on this page most of the things are similar to the post because we are just going to we are just updating the content which is already posted okay so if we have posted a file with a, any name say a b c d in uh, first step then for the second step we are going to change the file name to something which we can verify that it has been changed so that is the difference which we are going to made in, make in the body data itself Thank you. Hello friends, welcome. So today we are going to do the in the continuation of the last lecture wherein we uploaded the content on the Google Drive. This was the content which we uploaded in the JMeter session and now we are going to do is we are going to update the same content which we have got so let us see how we can do that let me run the request which we had uh, last time so this is the request which we were using so if you go down in this particular request you will see a field of ID let me zoom it a bit for you Uh, okay so just scroll down and you will see a field of ID so this is the ID which we need to use just copy this ID and you can keep it in your notepad file So once we have the ID ready, let us change the name of this request, post request and let us create another request which will be your put request. So let me change it to put request. Now what we need to do in put, let us make it HTTPS and the URL will be this one the server name and in the path what we need to do is this is the path and in the after the files we are going to put the ID which we got from the first request okay I think I have deleted it so let me run it again and get it yeah don't worry about the failure of post request put request because we are still 
uh, creating it we just want this id so yeah i have got the id now i will paste it here this is put and in body data what we will do is we will copy the same content which was there for the post request put it in the put request but just to see that yes this is the content which is the updated one so we are just adding the text updated in front of that so this looks like the correct request which we are going to send headers and all there will be no change in the headers and I'm going to disable the post request because we have already posted a content so we don't want it to change and we want to edit the same content on the server so let's run this put request now okay we have got a success let me just uh, expand it a bit so in the response data we have got all the information related to the uploaded content and in the request it is the updated request which we have sent and then the sampler result which is showing us the content so let us go to the drive and see whether we have got the expected content or not so let me open google drive okay so here you can see whatever we had jmeter session that has been updated so this is how put request works it updates the content whatever we are sending and it will just uh, work using the post request whatever we have updated using the post request it will just change that and update it for any data that we require so friends in the next class we are going to see how we can delete any content from the server from the Google API server. So we'll see that in the next class. Thank you. So friends, uh, now we have successfully done post request and updating of the file also. Now we are going to do delete, deleting the file which we have used in step one and step two. Either we can delete the file directly after post or we can delete after put. So in this example, we wanted to do multiple things. So we have, we are going to delete the one which is there in the post or in the put also. So now in the delete also, the content of the body, uh, the body data is going to remain same. Only thing which we will be changing here is the URL which it is going to hit, which is the server name this which is this and this and we are going to find for the delete file also so let's open google and find out the uh, url for deleting so as you can see we have the one for update we have already provided it now we can see here that there are different kind of actions which are there on the left side left panel of the google drive api so let us see if this delete one will help us to delete a file okay so it says permanently deletes a file owned by the user without moving it to trash so we can use this one because we are looking for a permanent deletion of file so we can just note the url and also this is the reference url for you where you can go to get more details about the delete api so you can just uh, scroll down and see how we can use this api and how we can get the response back and very important thing that if this response uh, if the request is successful for delete then we are not going to get anything in the response body and in response in the request body we are going to specify the request which is same as what we have supplied for other posting and updating the file if we want to delete the uh, file which we is, which has been updated then our request 
uh, body should match the one which we have for update and if we are using the post file so we need to match our body content with post file so these are the things that you need to keep in mind when you are doing a google drive api you can all get all the information from for the google drive api through the documentation which is provided by the google developers and there are uh, urls which we need for application that we have already provided and you can use the same ones in the jmeter script and you can see in the lectures also how we have done it thank you hello friends so in the last few classes we have studied about different methods of rest api like get post put and today we are going to study about the delete method so whatever content we have posted on the google drive what we can do is we can delete that content using this uh, api method so let us see how we can do that this is the same example which we were using in the last class for post and put so let me disable put now and let me add another method here which is the sampler so the sampler here will be for the delete so here we are going to put the protocol as https and the server name is same as www.googleapis.com the method here will be delete and the path for delete will be this one which says the drive slash v3 slash files and after that we are going to put the id of the file so the id of our file is this one which we fetched in the previous lecture and in the body data we are going to put exactly the content which is there in the post or if you have executed the updated one we can just post the updated one here and just paste this content so once we have this content pasted then next what we are going to do is just execute our delete request so let me execute it so we have got a success for delete also if there is a success for delete you will not see anything in the response data and in the request data we will see the information which we have sent in the request so here the title jmeter session should be deleted so let's go to our google drive and see whether this particular session or this particular folder which we had created in the previous lectures is it deleted or not so friends i am on my google drive let's search the drive for jmeter session this is the file which we were looking for and yes we have not seen this item in our search results so you can see that this particular file has been successfully deleted using the google drive delete method so friends i hope that this is clear now how we can use the different methods like post put and delete so you will be able to run this methods yourself and they are very easy to use and you can just use them using the particular api details if you have the path and if you know what needs to be passed in the body data and what you need to pass in the authorization so most of this information is always available on the website or on the apis which we are using so they will always give you this kind of information because they want to discuss it with others that what they need to send for using their public apis so once this information is used then you can use it for your jmeter script so make sure that the thread group which you are passing it's not a of high number otherwise it will impact the apis thank you hello friends in today's class we are going to discuss about the difference between 
soap and dress web services well as the definition says that soap is simple object access protocol and rest is representational state transfer these two protocols have been properly uh, popularly being used for transmitting the data in the apis so when we transmit the data between the apis there is a set of format which is followed so soap supports only xml format but rest supports different formats like json and xml etc whenever we send the data on the website on the network then the data which is sent through json format it is much cheaper than that sending it in the xml format so sending the data through rest is definitely cheaper than sending the data through soap another point is that soap is the, is using generic transport for the transmission of data and but rest uses http and https soap can't use rest because it is a protocol but rest can use soap web services because it is a concept and can use protocols like http and soap there are different standards which are followed in soap and these standards are strictly followed however rest does not follow any such kind of standards soap requires more bandwidth and resource than rest so rest is using less bandwidth and resource as compared to soap so these days whatever transmission is done most of them is using rest based web services whichever are the new apis if there is any old api or depending on the requirement that whether we need xml uh, format to transport transmit the data in that case only soap is being used because it is a bit uh, difficult to implement and use let me show you how soap api looks like so we are going to a website for global weather in this you can see there are two types of functions get cities by country is one which we will use so here you can you see that there is a method for soap and then we have uh, for http get and post as well so if you focus on the one which we have for soap here you can see that the communication needs to be done using this particular xml you can identify the xml when it has a uh, this xml version encoding utf8 specified on the first line so that means this is a xml and this is called the soap envelope which is in which we are going to keep all the contents related to the soap xml whenever we are transmitting the data using the soap then we have to pass some headers and those headers include soap action also so soap action is passed in the header when we are transmitting the data so it needs to be included in the request along with that these are the additional uh, information that we need to add like content type which we have already discussed in the earlier lecture and this is the content length so these are also the other headers that we need to include but most of the soap request will have a soap action with them which is different from any other uh, request which is sent from the rest based api so this is how the soap based api looks like now i will show you how the rest based api looks like so for the rest based api i have just come to google and we can open google maps api which I, we had seen earlier as well so i will just give you a quick recap of that and here in the request there is a different way in which we can create the request for google map uh, for the rest based api so i'm clicking on the google maps direction api
okay so it took a bit time so here you can see that this is the url which we need to pass uh, for getting the response to the rest based api so you can see the difference that here in the uh, rest based api it is just a simple url which you need to edit with the api key and for any other fields we can just pass it as the parameters in uh, the way we saw in jmeter but in the case of rest based api the in the case of sorry soap based api we have a xml and we need to edit the data inside that xml so that is how the difference between rest and soap makes it easier for a person to use rest based api so it depends on the requirement like which api you need to use and uh, both are equally important in case of transmission of data in the APIs. So thank you. Hello friends. Today we are going to see how to create a script for SOAP based API using JMeter. We will be using the example of global weather API to see how the data is transmitted using the soap based api so let's start so this is the global weather api which we are going to use this is the same one which we had seen in the last class also where we discussed about the difference between soap and rest based services so here you can see that in the api it has given us some details let's see and the details so it has given us the xml which we need to post and the different headers that we need to pass so let's do that one by one now this is the xml which we will be using for posting the data in jmeter so let me open jmeter in jmeter we are going to add a new script and we are going to add a new test plan so here you can see that this is by default blank now on the test plan i'm going to add first of all a thread group and inside the thread group i'm going to add a logic controller we will take the simple controller here and in the simple controller i will add the request which is the http HTTP request that we need to add which is in the sampler so where is it okay here and then in the controller only we are going to add the header manager because that is what we are seeing is being passed in the in the uh, request so just paste it above the request so test plan thread group simple controller and this is the structure which we have created everything is blank as of now as you can see okay so one by one we are going to fill it up so let's start with the request here in the request you can see that this is the xml that we need to pass so just copy it and we are going to paste it in body data because this is a xml next is the server name so server name is this one the host and what is the path so path would be here because we are looking for the api which is get cities by country once this is done we'll go to the header manager so we can see that these are the headers which were passed So there are three headers content type content length and soap action so let's add them to the header manager of our script one by one so i'm adding the content type firstly content type and then just copy this value here then we are going to add the content length here and uh, again in the same manner we will add the length here so length is something which we can specify uh, so content length can be anything so we can just specify any random number which is a large number next is soap action which i'm going to add 
so let me add the soap action this is the soap action which will go in the header for the uh, soap request so as i mentioned earlier that this will be passed in the header for the soap request and this will guide the soap request to the correct api now we have added all the data so what we are going to do is we will add the listener go to test plan and add the listener here and through the listener we will be able to see whatever we have done uh, what is the uh, output of that so in the thread group by default you can see that it is one uh, thread one ramp up period and one loop count so i'm going to just run it okay let's save it first uh, i will save it as soap api example api example and just save it uh, okay so now we have the request and let's see what we have got in the response okay let me see why is it that let's try it again let me save it again so example 2 okay so now we have got it so first because it was a post uh, request that's why we didn't get the data in the first time because first time it was sending it as a get data was trying to get the data from this site rather than sending a post request so we have sent this post request now uh, these are this is the value which we have passed these are the headers which we uh, passed and this is the response which we have got so let me copy this response and see what we have got xml editor um mm, actually xml format is something which we are looking for here so let's format it and format okay this is the xml let us see what we have got okay let's try to study this xml a bit to see whether we got the expected response or not so i can see here that you have got in the get cities by country result you have got this data and uh, the met the api was supposed to return the cities for the country which we whichever country we have passed now you can see that we are not getting any data here because there is uh, something called new data set which is returned and this is not the expected response because we should have got the cities of the country so let's go back to our script and see the request again now you can see in the request that we copied it from the website we copied it from our global weather api now here you have to keep in mind that whatever xml you are passing it will require some input parameter also now this one has the input parameter as country name how do i know that firstly the color of the length and the string is a slightly blue if you can see and also if you go here there is a option of get cities by country and this is says test so what it is doing is they have created a harness kind of thing that in here you can pass any country's name like usa and when you click on invoke then it should return you the list of uh, cities in that particular country so i think it's not returning for usa maybe because it is accepting its full name let's check that okay so this is uh, this is not accepting uh united states of america also because it have, must have 
used a different name for country name and they have not provided that list so that is something which is not provided here so let's try to take another one which is not uh, complicated okay so it says uh, it returns all for all so I think the validation which they have not uh, added here is that uh, whether it accepts space or any special characters with the name of the country or not because it's returning fine for Africa and if I enter India also okay so it is returning for India also so maybe because we are putting the name in such a manner or we are putting the name in let me try America also okay no it's not accepting any other name so let us try to stick to a different name and what is this okay this is the same thing right let's check it and we are going to use Africa or we can use India also okay so we will get all the cities name so let's do this change in the script also so in the request you can see that we passed string and we did not change this value so I'm changing this now let's clear it and run again and let's see if we get the expected output now mm, yeah looks like we have got the expected output from this particular API you can see that we are getting all the different uh, states and cities of the country India so let me just copy this here and paste it in the online formatter which we have format XML and I would like to show you the response so just copy it and we will paste it in our notepad file okay so you can see now that we have got the expected response we have got the country name and the city name so what was expected from this API it completed that and this is the same response which we are getting when we use their test harness also so that means that whatever uh, request was sent from our API it provided us the right response now every time it won't be possible for me to sit here and validate this data so let's add some assertion here so that it can validate on its own whether the data which is returned is correct or not so I will just add assertions and in assertion let me add response assertion and response assertion I can add um, Ahmedabad so we have to make sure that the name matches whatever is returned by the API so I'm copying this because this is the expected response and uh, let's clear and check whether the assertion is working okay so assertion says yes this name is present and uh, in order to test the assertion that it's working fine or not we should do a negative test also and yes it is failing so that means that response assertion is working fine so let's change it back to a expected response now we have done this and we have changed it for a value of India now suppose I want this value I don't want to come to the XML every time because this is a small XML if I want it for multiple XMLs and if I want this information for if I want to use this information of uh, the country name in different different XMLs then I need to know the uh, then I need to 
parameterize this particular value. So let's see how we can do that. Here I will add the user defined variables in the config element and let's drag it to the above the thread group. In the user defined variables I will add the name as country name and value we can keep as India for now and we are going to use this variable here to make it simpler for us. So I will just remove this name, add a dollar sign and inside the curly braces we have put country name. The variable name should exactly match with the name which you are providing in the user defined variables. So clear it and run it again. Let's see if we got the request right. Yes. So the request used India. Now if I want to check for any other country name then I can do that by just changing it okay so the request failed because the assertion failed it's not looking for Ahmedabad here so we can add a text which is generic for all the XMLs we can add some data like that so we can probably add the tag name here because if the XML is right then it will return the data of uh, city so city tag is definitely going to be there in the XML so we can use city so friends I hope that uh, creating the SOAP request using JMeter sending the data for same and getting the response validating the response and parameterization of the fields assertions uh, listeners all these de all these terms are now clear to you and you will be able to create the request yourself for any SOAP API Key things to keep in mind when you are sending the request for the SOAP APIs are that you need to make sure that the SOAP action if there is any it needs to be passed and in the request the path of the request should be correct and rest of the things are similar to the other API scripts which we have seen like response assertion adding the results tree and controller thread group and all other things are similar so we can change the name of the test plan so that it makes the request a bit of unique so we can add the name of the uh, api which we are using so we can say weather api and these are the user defined variables and in the thread group we can this is the thread group for getting get cities list and this is the simple controller for that so that is with that we can leave as it is and in the request we can also mention that get cities using country name so that this is uniquely identifiable that whenever we are adding some more uh, request here more thread groups then we if we want to make any change in this one then we can just straight away go here and check it and also the user defined variables we can make it specific to this particular thread group also because we are passing here uh, the country name we can use it here or we can make it uh, global and we can include the uh, user defined variable for any other uh, thread group also like if we add another thread group here for get suppose get country name then in that case we can add here any user defined variable so we can test this API make sure that you don't test don't put too much load on this API because uh, otherwise the API might go down and we don't want that because we want it to be available and it is this is a public API so 
we are using that but we don't want to put too much load on it so just for testing purpose you can check for 10 10 to 20 users maximum and uh, once you get the idea you can do the same exercise for the for the apis which you are testing in your uh, application or for yourself so thank you hello friends today we are going to study about popular jmeter functions jmeter functions have some inbuilt functionality available with them which we can use anywhere in the script and that helps us to reduce our tasks and we can readily use the functions which are available to do that particular task let's see how jmeter functions can be used what are the different type of functions which are available and how we can implement them in our script so the first function that we are going to study today is thread num function let's try to see how we can use this as the name suggests thread num thread is the number of users so for any particular request we can use this particular method to understand that this particular request is running for which thread or in other words this particular request is running for which number of user this is helpful if we have multiple users and we are running the request for them then we need to see that for which user that particular request is running and the workflow if we want to understand then till which particular uh, page has the user run till which particular request has the user executed this so in those cases it is very much helpful let's try to understand this using this particular example so this is the request the sampler which we have so i will add this particular method here so in order to add the method you need to put first the dollar sign curly braces and inside the curly braces i will be putting the method number let's run it so you can see here that it says post request one why does it say that because we have added this function to confirm that which number of thread is running this request if i increase the number of users to five then let's see so it is giving us the thread number for all the users now let me do one thing and check this particular request for multiple users so if i paste this request inside the controller itself and change the name of the request so what i would say is my request and what we are planning to see here is that for how many users the my request uh, runs so let me clear it basically the thread group is at the top it says five so both the requests should run five times each right so let's see okay so you can see that it started to fail for the fourth user for the fourth user both the request have failed for the third user post request has passed and my request has failed and similarly for post request 4 for for the fourth user both the requests have failed and same for the fifth user both the requests have failed so we can dig into the error and see what is the reason that the same request which was passed for the first and second user it is working fine but for the third user and so on it started to fail so that phase we can investigate further that from which stage does the request started to fail that's how thread num function comes into picture and helps us to identify for which user the problem starts 
from which user the problem started as you can see from here that it started from the third user let me show you again and remove the thread num function and then you can see the difference here let me clear it all for you and run it okay now you are not sure for which request does it start to fail for which user does it start to pass so that difference is not clear when we are running the request without the thread number so it is always advisable to add this function thread num function and that will help us to give a clear picture of the user and it also helps in analyzing the failures make sure that this is case sensitive so make sure that you pass it in the same manner that i have specified here this is the name of the function let me copy it here this is how it needs to be passed in the script also so if i run it again then you will be able to see that what is the problem and for which user it was working fine for which user it started to fail that's how thread number function helps us hello friends today we are going to study about another popular function for jmeter which is known as the sampler name this is the format of the function first the dollar sign then curly braces two underscores and then the name of the function in this manner we can add any other function name also this is the format which we need to put for every function name there are other functions also which we will be studying so please keep in mind that this is the format for that particular function name so coming back to sampler name so sampler name is the name of the sampler added in the request this type of function comes into picture when we have multiple samplers multiple thread groups and we want to pin pick the uh, sampler which we are using so in that case sampler name comes into picture let's see in jmeter how we can use it so this is our jmeter script in this we have different components now sampler name is the name of your parent sample here in the test plan this is itself the parent so we are not going to add the method sampler name over here because it will not execute the test plan itself if we are adding it in for example response assertion then it will tell us that yes response assertion belongs to this particular sampler which is the http request for post let's see how we can add it so in response assertion if i want to add the sampler name also then i can just do that by using the same format that we were using now in view results tree i am going to just clear and run it again okay so the request has failed because we have added some invalid data in the view results see you can see that response assertion underscore post request now post request is coming from the name of the sampler if i change this request to something else say i am changing it to sampler name or uh, to make it better let's make it my sampler name so that you don't get confused by the name of the function so let me uh, delete it and run it again yeah in response assertion you can see the name of the sampler being displayed so this comes into picture if we have multiple samplers and we are checking the assertions for all the methods then we can straight away know that this particular assertion belongs to which particular sampler rather than looking into the details for each and every 
assertion. This is one example in which way you can implement sampler name function. Thank you. Hi friends, so today we are going to study about one more type of function which is known as the counter function. So let's see the format first of all for counter function. So in the same way, the way we have passed another other functions, in that way only we are going to pass the counter function. However, the counter function requires some parameters also to be passed to it. So we are going to pass the parameters true or false to the counter. In a bit we'll understand that what is the meaning of true and what is the meaning of false. And next will be any name which you want to give to the counter. So I am just using the word result. This is the manner in which we need to use counter. So let's see how we can use it. So I'm adding the count function to the sampler name so that we can know that this is belongs to which thread. Basically wherever you will add it, it will increment the value. True means that we don't want the value to be incremented and we want the value to be kept separate for each thread. But false means that yes, we want the value to be incremented. So let's see. In the view results tree, what do we get now? So you can see for all the sampler names, we are getting one because this is the first sample. If I copy and paste this here and let's run it again. You can see again that it is just mentioning it as one. For one instance, it is keeping the value as same, no matter how many samplers I will add here. So let's go back and change it to false and see what difference it makes. Let's run it again. Now, if I have made it false, okay, it's true for one and false for one. That is why we are seeing so many requests. So I have removed the one in which it was true. Let me run it again for you. So here you can see that the value is getting incremented. Now there are two types of scenarios. Whether we want the counter variable to be same for the whole run or we want different values to be passed. So in that case, it helps us to use different kind of counters. This is the function of this particular method. And what is the purpose of the variable which we have specified here? Result. The variable is basically used to store the value of the counter. So let's try to see how it helps us. So I'm adding the value of the result which we have from here in another call. So what we can do here is pass the variable in this format. So if you can see it, I have added the variable name in this manner. Underscore is mand not mandatory. So we have dollar sign curly braces and the name of the variable and that's all we need to do now let us run it again and see how the variable name goes so first is the name of the counter which we can see here and inside that we have the assertion and assertion has the same name uh, same value of counter as that of the sampler because we are using this variable here we can use the variable at multiple places like we can pass the variable at in the call as well 
let us see right now if you can want to see let me show you so it says it expected the text as ankita so now uh, with the second change which we have done we have added the variable name in this call so it should give us ankita 1 let us see if it does or not let me go to the assertion yeah so it has given us ankita 1 because we have added the variable to this particular assertion pattern also so you can use this counter anywhere in the call or anywhere in your test run and it will work in the same manner just need to keep in mind the functions which we are using the methods the parameters and how to use the boolean parameter true or false and how to use the uh, variable name let me show you one more time we can pass it in the value also so i've passed it in the value now in the request where we have in the request where we have passed the value country name as india it should give me country name with a counter so let me delete all the request and uh, i'm making the thread as one because now we are just focused on one so yes you can see here that it has passed country name as india one because we have passed this particular value of this particular function here and it has counter set so in this manner you can use the counter anywhere in your script wherever you require the function hello friends so today we are going to study about another popular function in jmeter which is the time function so time function is used like this so let's see how we can use the time function this is my script in which i want to use the time function so i can go to any request and just paste this function name here let's see how it looks like so you can see here that we are getting the time over here let me change this to city so that uh, doesn't create any confusion that it is failing because of the function so let's see what is the error okay let me just uh, fix this script for you so that you can get the idea about why it is not working correctly yeah so we are going to pass here the correct name now it is going to run fine okay so now you can see here in the sampler name here i have passed the time and this is the time which is displayed in milliseconds so this is one way to pass the time function and you can get in all the requests you can get the time also if i increase the number of threads here so it will display me the time uh, which is in milliseconds for both the requests so this is how it will display for all the requests now suppose i want the time in a specific format so what i need to do for that is in brackets i need to pass the parameter for it so the another way in which we can use the time function is using the parameters so in the parameters what we need to pass let's check it from the help so if you go to options function helper dialog 
in that you can select all the functions from here and you can see what is the purpose of each function so we are concerned here about time and in time function what all is optional the format string for simple data format what we are that means the arguments are optional and name of variable in which to store the result that is also optional so if I go to see the help here now you can see these are the different formats in which we can get the time so let me use the first one just copy it and paste it here ymd that means year month and date so in view results tree let us run it again so now you can see the difference between the time so it will get the systems time current time and date here we have passed only year month and date so it is giving us only the date but if we want the time so let's see how we can add that so we can add hours minute and second also hms so let me add that in front of this and run it so you can see that it's giving me the hour minute and second also along with this so there are different formats given here where you can which you can use uh, to pass the time format and now there was one more thing which was mentioned that we can give the name of variable also so if i want to store this time in any but any variable so what i need to do is i can use here result and just to see what the result is look like i will pass it as a variable the way we did it in a previous section uh, previous session also so in result it will store this particular value and that same value can be used in another request reason being that suppose i want the same value of time to be used at different places but if i pass this function so it is going to hit uh, the server again and again to get the time value although the year month and date is going to remain same but the seconds will change frequently so you may or may not get the same value in another request so we can what we can do here is we can just store this value in a variable and pass that variable and then we will have the same value I'm running the script again so now you can see in the assertion that we are getting the same value as in the request so it's having exactly same value here that is the reason that we use this variable so that the same value can be passed to different requests and we need not use the function again and again for each and every request so friends i hope the way in which you can use the time function is now clear to you and hope it helps you in creating your scripts hello friends so today we are going to study about another important function which we use in jmeter and that function is the uuid function so let's start from the scratch and get the name from jmeter help itself that what is the exact name of the function that we need to use so i'm going to options function helper and here we are looking for the function which can give us the uuid so function which can give us uuid okay this one and next we will go to help uuid is a unique number which is in this kind of format so it is a unique number which is generated every time it uniquely identifies a request and it comes into handy a lot of times so we can use the uuid function to add any kind of random number to our request so the format for the uuid as you can see here it is mentioned so we can give uuid and then brackets 
I'm just going to copy this here and let's go to our JMeter and again in the sampler name I'm going to add the UUID in view results tree the listener let's run it okay so it's not giving us the result why is that because we have forgotten to do the underscore for this so I'm deleting it run it in, running it again now you can see that UUID is being generated so as you can see for both the requests the UUID which was generated was different so it is a unique identifier that is the main purpose of UUID function so that we can use the unique identifier to uniquely identify any kind of request so friends thank you another important function for jmeter is machine ip this helps us when we are running tests on different machine and we want to get the ip address for that particular machine let's see again how we can use this particular method so here you can see there's a machine ip and a machine name also so i will be using the machine ip i think by now you all are familiar how we can use the different functions it is very simple simply go to help and just see how we how what is the syntax and how we can use that particular function and implement the same in your script so this is the last function which we are studying and rest of the functions you can just check from this help file as and when you need them we have already covered the popular ones so yeah so i have pasted the machine ip here now i'm going to run it again so yes this is the ip of my machine which is being displayed here so as i mentioned that this comes into picture when we are running tests on different kind of machines so you need to know for which request what was the machine ip and that at that time we will get the help from machine ip function and if i want to use the machine name so i can do that also only thing that you need to keep in mind is that it should exactly match with the function name which is mentioned here it should be it because it is case sensitive and you cannot think of changing the name here i cannot make it small i and p and run it so in that case it's going to not execute the function it has to be the exact method name which is mentioned so let me copy it here okay so let me paste it again yeah so here i'm going to show you the machine name also and it's very easy to use any function now so yeah you can see here that it's showing me the machine name as well and machine ip is basically inp capital that is why we got the machine ip as the function name and not the what the function executed so yeah you can see here this is the machine ip and this is the machine name so these functions are also very useful thank you hello friends today we are going to study about csv data config csv data config helps us to fetch the data from a csv file it helps to parameterize the data you can use variables and fetch the values for different keys using this csv data config it is very easy to use 
but the advantages that it offers are really vast. They come into picture when you have to suppose run your script for multiple users. At that time, you can just put all the information in the CSV data config and you can run your data. You can run your script with the data. So let us see how CSV data config helps us. So I'm opening my JMeter script. Here in the thread group, I will be adding the CSV data config in the config element. I'm just going to paste it here at the top level. Now you can see here that CSV data config has different fields. Like the first one says the name of the config. This is any name which we can keep like my CSV and then it has the fields for the data source like file name, file encoding. File name is the field for the uh, file which holds your data. So as you can see as I hover on this it's going to give me the information about what this particular field is doing. So whichever file we are using we are going to provide the name of that file. So let's do one thing. Let's create a CSV file with the data and populate these fields side by side. So I'm just going to the JMeter folder. And in the JMeter folder, I'm going to the bin. And here I will create a new CSV file. So select any text document and we can name the file as csv data file dot csv now in this file we are going to add the data like i can keep the data as india because this is the one which we have been using in the script to fetch the city's name so i will write india and close this save it now coming back to the file name, so here the name of the file will be CSV data file. So let me copy this file name and paste it here. Next is the file encoding. So file encoding need not be put here because file encoding is specifically for an any encoded file. Now comes the variable name. This is the variable name which we are going to use in the script and it is going to refer to the CSV file which we have. So I will write here country name because that is the variable. Ignore first line. No, we don't want the first line to be ignored. Usually the first line is ignored. If suppose I have written here country name to identify that which uh, data is show, is being shown here. In that case, what it will do is it will ignore this first field of country name and it will go to the second line which has the real data. This is just like a column name. But right now we are just doing directly from the first line itself. So I can put it as country name. And I can ignore the first line and we can make it false because we don't want the first line to be ignored. Then comes delimiter. Delimiter is used when we have multiple variables. Suppose if I add one more field here and I say my name and once I add the data here, same thing needs to be added as the variable name over here. So I'm writing my name. Let's move on and see the other fields. Allow quoted data. Again, this is not a quoted data. So we will put it as false. Recycle on end of file means that if the file is, if the number of users is in the thread group, I take it as 10. And my script, my CSV file has only one line. So what it will do is once the end of file is reached, that is after it takes this data it goes to the next line and it does not see any uh, information it is blank so what it will do is for all the 10 users it's going to recycle the same input and once the end of file is reached it is going 
going to go back to the first entry that is the meaning of the uh, recycling of the end of file stop thread on eof no we don't want the thread to be stopped once the end of file is reached we want it to continue because we have already selected recycling on the end of file sharing mode is just the current thread and there can be option like it should the csv file should be shared with all the threads or current thread group so we are going to put it as current thread group because we want it to be used for all the threads in the current thread group now let us use these variables at specific places so let me go to the script and see where this can be used so let me remove this data from here and instead of India I'm going to just put this value here so as you know the variable needs to be inside the curly braces so what is the name of the variable that we are using the name of the variable is country name so let me put let me show you again here is the variable name for the first file it is country name so this is the one which I will be using in the script also so here we need to pass the value and instead of value we are passing the uh, variable name which is country name now here I'm just removing this Ankita and let me put the second field which we had used in the CSV file the second field which we have used here is my name so instead of Ankita what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put here my name so if you have noticed I have put M as small and N as capital this is known as the camel case so we usually give the variable name in this format which is known as the camel case so now you can see that in the response assertion we have we should get Ankita and in the country name which is this field we should get the name of the country which we have specified as India now let us clear the view results tree sampler or uh, sorry listener and see what information we get from here make sure that your csv file is closed before starting your run and make sure that the location is also correct since we have put it in the bin folder so the file name uh, needs to be just the name of the file dot csv we are not giving any path here I will let you know how to give the path also so I'm just running the script now before running let me change the number of users yeah it is one and uh, let us check that all the fields are correct here okay so this is the file name so let's go back to the file which we have used and check the extension of the file so it's txt so let's make the extension of the file which we are using in jmeter also as txt so that it can recognize the file okay and now in view results tree I'm going to run it so the request has failed because the in the assertion we had passed the wrong name but we now need to investigate that whether it's failing for the right reasons whether it has got the input from the csv file or not so let's check that first okay yes so in the country name it is getting india which we had passed in the file and let's go to the response assertion and check that whether it has got the right information or not so it says that it has not got it and it has got the variable name instead let's try to find out why is that okay <clears throat> so friends if you can see here it's because we had passed the wrong name here so I'm going to change this to camel case which is now capital 
that is why it was not able to recognize the element so now we are going to run it again that is why it's very important to check for the first time each and every request in detail because maybe we are expecting that it should fail but we also need to see that whether it's failing for the right reasons or whether it's a, some failure from our end that is the true assertion so i'm going to clear it and let's run it again and see this time so we already know that in the sampler it's correct and in the request assertion yes now this time it passed the value correctly because we were using the right variable now let's do one thing and run this request for 10 users as we had selected that once first line is used once end of file is reached it should recycle the first entry again so we need to check whether it is doing that or not and just to see some green areas i will change the text in the csv data file and let me open it instead of my name i would like to give some other name which is valid so that is the city name or uh, yeah let's keep it as a tag city which was the assertion to get in the response file and let me change the country to africa this time just to make sure that it is using this data let's go back and i have done it for let me do it for five times so that we can see the key, uh, request clearly i'm running it now okay so it has changed to green color because the assertion is passing okay let us see the request yeah it passed the request for africa which was the new value for csv and yes in the other request also it is using africa now let us do one more test and change the values here so in the first field i have done africa and in the next thread let me do india here and let's fail it by writing okay okay now we have two two set of data the first one is correct second one is incorrect let us see how the csv deals with this kind of data so i'm clearing the request again let us make the number of threads four this time just to make it even or six because i want to see how it works okay so what happened was for the first one it took the data as africa for which the assertion also passed but for the second one it failed because it took the name of the country as india now you can see here also that in the assertion it took ankita so that is the difference what happened here so there were six thread so it alternatively fetched the data so we saw that for the first one it took the data as the first line second one as this then third one again for the first and so on so this is how the csv file is fetching the data now if i run it for five times what will happen for five users so this is hap this is what happens for the five users so it came for the first time for the initial time you are already aware for the first four time the data was picked up alternatively and for the last call it it picked the first line and after that it ended the number of threads so friends i hope the concept of using the csv file to fetch the data is now clear also if you want to add more variables to your csv file just do a comma and add your variables here and you can play with the text file and as and add as many rows as you want and see the behavior of your script in that thank you 
Hello friends, today we are going to study about assertions in JMeter. Assertions help us to validate the data which we receive in response. Suppose I send any request and get the response back. So I don't want myself to be there every time to validate whether the response received from JMeter was right or not. Hence we need assertions and assertions help us to validate this data in our absence and also we can validate the assertions itself by seeing whether it is working as expected for the same information which we are looking for or not. So let's start with some popular assertions which we can use in JMeter. Now in my script I am going to go to the thread group. This, this, this is the same script which we have used for getting the cities by country and it is a post request. Now I need to add assertion to it. So in order to find out which type of assertion will best suit my test plan, firstly I will run it for once. So let me go to the thread group and see what I get in the response. Okay, so my test has executed and let me see what I get, what is there in the request. Okay, we had sent country name as India and in the response we have got the list of cities. And let us see the sampler result also. What all sampler uh, data is there? There are some headers and response code, message and data type. Okay, after I have studied this information I am going to decide on what kind of assertion do I need to put. So let's start with the first very popular assertion in JMeter which is our response assertion. Response assertion validates the information which we have received in the response data over here and also in the sampler result which is which includes the sum of the response data. So we can validate all this information using response assertion. As you can see here, there are different fields which we can test in the response assertion, which includes text response, response code, response message, headers, request headers, URL sample, document, and if we want to ignore any status. So all these can be checked using response assertion. Let us see the popular ones here. So first is the text response which we have covered earlier also. So in the text response we can see that what is there in the text response which is uh, coming and we can validate the same information. So let's say text response add and here I am going to put India. Is it there in the response? Yes it is there in the response so we can validate using this text response. So let me clear this and run it again. It's working fine. It has passed successfully. Because in the response we had India. Now let me change this text so to some other location. Let me make it Africa and see whether our response assertion passes. No, it does not pass. And what do I get here? It clearly says test failed, text expected to contain Africa. So this is the message which was expected but it was not there. That is why our response assertion failed. So now let me add the response assertion again for you so that it is, diff uh, it is separate for diff separate type of assertions which we are doing. So next we will do for response code. So response code is this particular code which we get in the response message. Response code 200. Whenever your request is successful, we are going to get response code as 200. So we will validate whether in our response we got the right response code or not. So let me add the response code here. First is we will validate with the right data. Also we have this assertion so let me put correct 
value in the response assertion which is using the text response so i'm running it it passed again because we have passed the valid data now let me change this value to some other code HTTP error codes which we have covered in the previous class so we are going to put different different kind of error codes here so let me clear it and see okay it failed the response assertion again it says test fail code expected to contain 301 now let's see if I fail this also if I fail both the assertions then what is the result yeah it has failed both the assertions so for the first one it says the text expected to contain Africa and the second one is related to the response code so let us rename this assertion with a valid name so we can mention here text response assertion and here I'm going to say response code assertion so that we are able to understand what is failing and where okay so we have covered what is there in the response assertion if you want to check further for response message also then again you need to check in the response message what is received it says okay and we can add the same assertion in the same manner by doing add here and we can add multiple multiple assertions and you can change the matching rules also whether you want it to equal uh, exactly match with whatever is there in the response or it can be substring so substring here means that in the response data we have this as a part of the whole string it is there as a child of the whole string so which is called the substring if i want this particular assertion to exactly match means that i want that whole xml should exactly match with what i am sending then in that case even if i type valid text here the assertion should fail let us see what happens here i am removing the previous result and see what is happening so the text response assertion also failed now you can see here that it has the whole xml it's not able to paste the whole xml here but it is comparing the whole xml with the text which we have sent which is india so it's comparing these two things rather than in the previous way when we had selected substring so it was just checking that whether this particular text which we have passed is there in the response data anywhere in the response data if it is there then it is going to pass this particular assertion so this is the difference of different different fields here we can also do contains which means that it will test whether it is there in the string and again matches and equals are for exact match and we can do not to check whether that this particular text is not there in the string in the response data so based on this rule whatever we set here we can check the assertion based on our requirements so we have done the response assertion next let's uh, now move to the next type of assertion let's see which is the other assertion which we can do yes we can take the duration assertion duration assertion as uh, it is mentioned in the name duration that it checks whether the response was received in the correct amount or not expected amount of time or not so what exactly is meant by this now you can see here that in the request which we sent the number of bytes which we, which were sent was 7970 connect time was 83 load time was 255 let's scroll down and see other details so all these details are there related to the 
related to this particular message. Now we want to see whether this particular message was received, the response data was received in the expected time or not. So let me do one thing to make it uh, understandable in a better way. We will add another listener here, which is the view results in table listener. So we have already covered all these listeners in the other class for listeners. So I'm not going to focus on all the fields here, but we will just run it and get the data which we are looking for. So here now you can see this is the time in milliseconds, which is 497. Now I need to see whether the request was the response was received in this particular time or not. So in the duration uh, assertion, what I'm going to do is write 500. Let me disable other assertions for you so that it is clearer. And uh, let's remove this. Yes. So now let's see how the duration assertion works. Okay. It says pass. And the sample time here is 276. And the duration, seven, duration assertion says 500. So it means that the request, uh, the response for the request was returned within 500 milliseconds. That is why it is a success. So now let us see the, let us change this duration, suppose 200 and run the test again. Okay, so this time the sample time was 350 and the insert, uh, in the assertion we had specified 100. That means we were expecting that the response will be received in 100 millisecond, but it took longer than that, 350, and that is why the assertion failed for us. And we can see in the view results tree also, if we go here in the duration assertion so it says the operation lasted too long it took 350 milliseconds but should not have lasted longer than 100 milliseconds so this is a message which we are getting along with that now let us do one more thing that there is a listener which is very helpful to see the results for the assertion let us add that also which is the assertion results listener so let me add that. Okay, so let us see how the response changes in case of the res uh, assertion results listener. Let me run it. So you have got the information in the assertion results only, which says the same information which we saw in the few results tree, but here it is directly coming as the message. But here you need to go down and see the assertion, what is the error. But in this assertion results, you can directly see what was the result. Same way we can see for other type of assertions also. So friends, we have covered different type of assertions like duration assertion, text response assertion, response code assertion. And in the next class, we will be covering few other assertion types. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome to another session for popular assertions in JMeter. Today we will be covering few other assertions in JMeter. So let's start with that. Let's add another assertion which we are doing today, which is in the thread group we have gone to add and then in assertions let me add another popular assertion which is the size assertion so in the size assertion we are going to check the size of the bytes so as you can see here in the view results table listener that we can see the bytes which are returned now we need to check whether the number of bytes is as expected or not so we can do again using size assertion. So here I can mention any number of bytes. For example, I will mention a lesser number. Let me clear all the data and see 
whether the assertion passes or not okay so now you can see it is so descriptive the listener which we added in the last session assertion lizard results listener so it's giving us the failure for both the duration assertion as well as size assertion so the what is the failure in size assertion the result was the wrong size it was 7970 bytes but should have been equal to 7000 bytes so this kind of data is uh, what is expected and this is what is received let me change this value to any other value so let's make it exactly same 7970 I'm disabling the duration assertion for you let us clear it and see again okay so this time our test case has passed that is why we are not seeing any failure in the assertion results also so it says clearly that it is 7970 bytes which matches with what assertion we were giving in the size assertion here also you have different options like we had in response assertion to check for response body response headers or the response code and also you can do the comparison you can play with these fields increase the value or whether we are expecting lesser than what is there in size in bytes or what is if we are expecting equal to greater than equal to so all these fields can be done uh, for size assertions these are the different options which we are getting in size assertion so let me disable the size assertion also and let's move on to another type of assertion I'm disabling it again I'm going to the thread group and let me add another assertion so I'm adding the XML assertion because we are playing with the XMLs we got an XML in the response so let me add this XML assertion here now in the XML assertion we are going to validate the XML which we are getting in response so let's see how we can do that now in the results tree we are seeing that this is the XML which we have got so we can change the format from here also uh, I'm changing it to XML so that it is clear so you can see the whole XML the XML is there in the format so it is going to validate for us whether we got the XML in response or not let us see how it uh, goes in this one so let us see the assertion results let me run it again so in the assertion results you can see that there are no failures that means the XML assertion passed and we got the XML in return which is what is there in the response also we have got the XML in return so let me try to fail this request for you and see what we got uh, what we get in the response for XML assertion I'm just uh, trying to fail it so yes now you can see in the XML assertion content is not allowed because in the response we are seeing that the request is uh, not valid to it's not going to the right address because we changed the address and in the response also we have not got any XML so that is why the XML assertion failed and we got the same thing in the assertion results also so that's how the XML assertion works now let us see another type of assertion I'm going back to the thread group let me click add assertions and let me do HTML assertion so HTML assertion again checks for the format it checks for these three formats like HTML XHTML and XML so let us see how it works 
I am disabling the XML assertion so that we can focus on the HTML one. Let me clear the results for you. And firstly, we are just keeping running it for the invalid data. So you can see that the errors are there and there are four warnings because we have changed the address. So let me change this address back to the correct one and see what we get in the assertion results. Okay, again we have got some errors because in the response what we are getting is a XML and not HTML. So let me change it to XML and see whether we still get this error or it works fine in that case. Yes, so if we change it to XML, so HTML assertion is working fine. Now another thing which we can do using this is suppose if I keep the format as HTML only as you remember that it was giving us some failure when we were using HTML format. So it is giving us some parser errors for one allowed zero and tidy parser warnings five and allowed zero. So what is this allowed is we can actually specify here how many errors are allowed. So let me put a 5 here in both the fields and let us run it. So it is saying it has passed because whatever error we were getting we have included it in the threshold. So what is threshold? Threshold means that we are uh, till this limit we are ready to accept the errors but if it is greater than this limit which is 5 then in that case only return the error for other cases do not return the error. So let us see and change this value again to 0 and here I am going to make it 1 and see what we get now. So here what is happening is that again it is giving us the error but this time it has the value in the threshold section also. So this is how we can specify any type of assertion that what kind of threshold it is ready to withstand. So these are the different type of assertions which we use in JMeter. And also what we can do is we can go to any file and read and write the results to that particular file. So how can we do that? So for example, let me go to the assertion results only and browse and we can put the file uh, we can write the results to any particular file so let me do one thing let me go back to my bin folder and create a file and browse to that particular file so let me open apache jmeter yes this is my folder so in that I'm going to the bin folder and let me create a new file here. So I'm putting it its name as assertions results file. Okay, it is of 0 KB at this point because it's not having any data. This is the file which we will be using. So let me go back to assertion results and open this particular file. So it's not showing up as of now. Let me go to bin again and yes this is the assertion results the txt file and we are going to open it. Okay we cannot see the results so just let it be like that because it is blank as of now. Let me do one thing, clear the results again, sorry, clearing the results and uh, let's run the test results again. So it is asking us whether we want to overwrite this particular file or whether we want to uh, append to the existing file or overwrite it. So right now it is blank, so we can keep it overwrite only. Okay, the test has executed. Now let us go to this file which is there in the bin folder refreshing it just to make sure that all the changes are there in the file. Let me open this file. Okay, so it is having all the data which we have here in the JMeter. 
we have it stored in the text file also. This is the uh, detail for the failure as well as it is giving us the information about the sampler and uh, the also giving us information about the latency and all different different kind of fields which we need for storing the data. So how this file uh, helps us? Suppose I start any performance test run at night. I can go to sleep and in the morning when I come I can just open this file to see the results. I can open it in Excel also that will give me a good division of uh, the different columns and from there I can see what all test cases passed which ones failed by having a good uh, distinction in the type of assertion which we are using in the type of request which we are using so that ways I can distinguish and I can see what is the data which we are uh, looking for which is the test case which is failing which ones are passing and then I can take actions accordingly and report the issues so this is really helpful for us. So friends, I hope different kind of assertions which we have studied are clear to you. Thank you. Hello friends. Today we are going to create a test suite using JMeter and understand how we can add different components to create a suite of test cases and how to execute them and then analyze the report. So let's go to the test plan and do a right click and add thread group and inside the thread group we are going to add any controller so let me add simple controller here now inside the simpler controller simple controller I'm going to add a sampler so the sampler which we use is the HTTP request sampler and in the thread group we are also going to add a config element which is the CSV data config let's move it here and uh, we are going to check for the API's today for the weather API which I will just show you how we can get it from the website so the API which we will be using is web service xnet and we are going to mention API here. Let's click enter and we can see that there is some API here. Let's click that or let me go back and there is one more API which I can see for converting the temperature. Okay, so let's use this particular API today and uh, once we get the API we need to just study a bit that what is the parameter that this particular API requires what are the parameters that we need to send along with this and what is the request and response like so today we are going to focus on the HTTP type of this API let us see how we can do it so in order to do uh, the API in order to run the API using JMeter what we do first is that we go to this test harness which is being provided by this website and run the API once so let us see the temperature it's 23 and it's uh, over here you can see that here it mentions that degree Celsius or degree Fahrenheit or degree Ranky like these are the parameters which it can accept and to this so we can mention here degree Celsius and we want to convert it to Fahrenheit so let me put Fahrenheit here and invoke okay so I'm not seeing any valid data using this particular API yeah not something which what I was expecting maybe because the temperature here is in double so let's try that also and invoke it again again it's not giving us the 
uh, change value or anything like that so what is the issue here we can see from this XML which is provided to us sorry friends I think uh, what's the issue is this script which is coming along with this so we can ignore this script and here is the value which is being converted into Fahrenheit so here the API has been uh, invoked successfully okay so yeah once we can see that it is working fine so let's go ahead and use this API for our JMeter test so in your application also when you get this kind of request to run the or use any kind of API it is always advantageous that you can see that same process maybe that app API is being used anywhere in your application or through any test harness which is given to you you can check that for how that API is working and uh, is it working with the parameters which is supplied to us so just validate that amount of data and then you can uh, use it in the JMeter don't straight away start it from JMeter itself you need to check it once through the application or any test harness and then you can uh, use it in your JMeter script okay so now let's scroll down and let's see firstly the HTTP get for this so what we are going to do is we will mention here the test plan name so the test plan name we can keep it as uh, we can say this is a very high level name which we are going to keep because I will not write convert temperature because uh, this particular site has multiple mul uh, multiple APIs so if I put the name of the test plan as convert temperature then it will be specific to one API which I don't want to do so what I will do is I will uh, keep the name as weather API because uh, that will help me to keep it separate from suppose if I want to do Google API tomorrow so Google API will be a separate one and in the weather API I will be having all the different uh, suites for different different API's that we are going to use so let's keep it like this weather API CSV data config we can keep the name like this uh, if we are going to use it then we'll just change the values here and thread group also we can mention that we are going to create either what we can do is in the simple controller we can add different requests or we can create two thread groups one for get and one for post so let me do one thing get or uh, in the thread group we can mention convert temperature and here in the controller we can keep it like this only simple controller that will let us know that what is the type of request this will send uh, when we change the value in the thread group and in the request we are going to mention it as get request okay so this is our now first thread group which we have created now inside this get request let's add the data based on the information which is provided here so firstly we have to mention the protocol so this is a HTTP protocol here it is mentioned let me zoom it a bit for you so here it is already mentioned that this is a HTTP so we can just write HTTP here and in the server name we need to provide the URL so server name will be this website name or IP okay we have given this method will be get only and then we need to give the path so in the path we are going to give this path this entire path will come here through which we are going to get the information okay and now let's move on and see what is the parameter that it requires so as you can see that it needs 
different different parameters like temperature from unit to unit so all these are mentioned as string and you can see here also that uh, for every key that's highlighted in green color and the value for it is highlighted in blue color so we can easily identify that yes there is some difference here in these parameters that we need to change so we are going to put some value here so we can put uh, the way we put it in the test harness which they have provided so let's put same values so temperature will be 23.00 sorry so from unit will be degree celsius and two unit will be degree fahrenheit okay now the parameters are good with this so we are going to pass the parameter over here in the path for now and later on we are going to make some changes in this script also so that it is more uh, maintenance free and robust alright so let's move on and see what all data is required by this now you can see that there are some headers which are going in the request so let's do one thing and add the header manager for these headers so let me go back to the request in the thread group go to add inside the config element we have the header manager just scroll it up a bit and in the header manager we are going to add the headers so let's copy the name for the header and this is the value all right this is the value and now we are going to put another header which is the content length and this value is as you can see again it's in blue color so we are going to put a value here so i'm just putting one lakh so we are good with the header manager also now coming back to the request it says that it is sending a xml for the request so let me copy this and in body data i can put the uh, xml so here it's requiring some data which is in the double okay so we can pass this information here okay now we are going to just uh, add a listener and see what is next with this particular api so we are going step by step adding each and everything based on this particular website what are the details mentioned in the document which they have provided and how we can use this information for the jmeter test so after this what i'm going to do is go to the test plan and add a listener this is the first step that we do before adding any kind of assertion before parameterizing anything firstly we just check that whether end to end it is working fine or not rest of the things can add the additional points but first the api should should be running successfully let's run it as you can see it is not executing and there is some error which we are getting in the console let me run it again try to run it again okay so let's uh, open this console and see what is the error that is being returned okay so if you can see this area which i am just highlighting and uh, you can relate with what it is trying to tell us that it is saying that file name must not be null or empty illegal argument exception 
and this is coming in which config element csv data set so let me just uh, go back to the script and see that we had added the csv data config but we did not add any fields in it so let me do one thing let me delete it for now and we can add it again if we need it if we need any data from csv we will add it but first we are just checking end to end it is working fine or not okay so now we have resolved the error and it should work correctly okay we have got a success let's go and see the request firstly okay the request looks like passed correctly with the information which we have passed it is a get request and the url is also correct okay so now let's go to the response data and the response is also correct 73.4 this is the same value which we were getting from running it on the uh, through the test harness also this is the same value so we are sure that yes this information which we are getting is correct okay so our get request is now working correctly now let's do one thing and add another request which is our post request in the same or different controller it's up to us how we want to do it so let's do one thing and add it in a different controller so let's see which controller we can add it so that it gets uh, executed okay so let's do if controller and let's add the sampler inside this HTTP request now this time we have to study about the data for post so get is already done just scroll down in the document and see what is the information about HTTP post that is been specified here so let's see the post one in the post you can see that the host is same because uh, we are using all the APIs from this and the protocol is HTTP again the method will change and the method will be post this time also the path will change because the path now is this we are just going to post on this particular path once this is done then we are going to see uh, what are the header managers so header manager look different now from the header manager which we were using in the get request so let's add the header manager since the header manager is uh, different so let's do one thing let's add another thread group only I will suggest that let's add a new thread group itself and inside this thread group we are going to move this controller so let me drag it inside this and I'm just dragging and posting the things at different location so you can see we can change the thread group as convert temperature get and for second thread group we can say convert temperature and post this is get API and this is the post API okay now inside this thread group we have the if controller and inside this if controller we have our HTTP request so you can see we have changed the path and now let's see what other information is required this is the body data which we need to pass so let's come here and in temperature we can do 23.00 and uh, we are going to pass the same information so let's go back to our request and fetch the information from there so it says in the two unit we had degree Fahrenheit and in the from unit we have 
degrees Celsius. It should exactly match with what is mentioned in this particular document. Here you can see that all these fields are mentioned. So it should exactly match with what has been mentioned in the website. It is case, case sensitive also. So I'm going to just paste it again so that we don't make any mistakes here. So once the request is ready, now we are going to see that how we can run it and what is the result of the post request. Let's go to the post request and verify that whatever we have added is correct or not. Just see that uh, the path and the uh, server name is correct. And now let's go to the if controller. And in the if controller, you can see we have not added any condition so far. So if controller, what it does is that whatever condition we are going to put here, if that condition is true, then it will go to this request and execute it. Otherwise, it will not execute this request. So let us do one thing that just for the time being and to show you how it works in the config element. We are going to add the, C, uh, the user defined variable. Let me scroll it up. And the, in the user defined variable, let us add a variable with the name where one and value you can keep as one for now. And in the if controller, we are going to use this particular variable and say that if the value of this variable is equal to is equal to one, then it is going to run it successfully. And since we have specified this variable as uh, one only, now here you can see the name is var one. So it needs in the condition also we need to specify the same thing. Okay, and this is in JavaScript which we have mentioned this condition. So let's now run the post request. What we can do is we can just disable this thread group. And because we are going to check for the post only for now and run it. Okay, so we have got a success here. Let us validate. In the request, it is correct. The URL is also for the post. And let's see the response. Okay, so we have got the response also. Correct, it is 73.4. So we have got now successful get as well as post request we were able to hit the APIs also successfully and we are able to get the post um, and the get response okay so now what we will do is let's add some assertion to this to validate this particular information so let me go to this and add the assertion let us see which assertion we can add here uh, let's try to add XML assertion because here we have got the response uh, back in the form of an XML. So in the XML assertion, it will assert that whether the response which is result received, it's an XML or not, or whether it's some uh, invalid data. And we can add a response assertion also. because we know that the response which we are going to get what it is so let us add here this is the response which we are getting from this api because it is a conversion so it is going to be 73.4 only for this value at least so we have added two assertions and we can keep it at a global level because they are, the value is same and the response for both the thread groups is again same. So let me enable it. And we can check for the assertion for both the type of request. Let me delete this and see what is what we are getting in the uh, response. 
so get and post both are successful also the assertion have passed now let us change the value for this I'm making it 24 for the get request and let's see in the result tree what we get here okay we need to change here also because this is the URL which it is posting so I've changed it to 24 here also now let us see in the view results get should fail okay yes it's failing and in the response assertion you can see that it expected uh, 73.4 because that's the text we mentioned here but it was not returned okay so now we have the assertion also we have the user defined variables also in the if controller and let us see if we change this user defined variable to suppose 2 then whether the post request runs or not let me delete it and run it again okay so you can see only get request executed because in the if controller it was validating that the value should be 1 but we changed the value to 2 so it did not get executed okay so now let's move on and parameterize the data which is passed in these requests because if I need to change any well if I need to change it to any other value or if I need to run it for any other value then I need to change it in the path which is a bit tedious task it will be easy to do it in the form of parameters so let's see how we can do that so in order to switch to parameters tab if I do it directly by clicking parameters it says you cannot switch because data cannot be converted to target tab data empty data to switch so that's what I'm going to do I'm just doing going to uh, copy it let me copy it to a notepad file let me open a new tab and paste it here and remove these fields from uh, this body data and go to parameter section now in parameters we are going to add these parameters one by one so let us see so the first parameter that we have is temperature let's add this temperature and put value here 24.00 for now and we can just uh, remove it from here so that uh, it's not executed from both the places next we have the from unit so just copy this from unit add another parameter and then put the value for this and next we are going to put another value which is the two unit and this is the third parameter for our request and then copy the value for this so we have all three now let's remove it from here in the path okay so I'm removing this also And we had added some assertion and we made this change so I'm going to make it back to 1 and uh, let's see in the results tree what is the request which we get so run it okay get is failing let us see what kind of request it constructed okay let me copy it and show you what is the request which we have got okay so it's fine okay uh, okay so what it is doing is it is adding this ampersand sign this ampersand sign is before this variable so in the URL which is there for the application hmm, 
okay so in the url as you can see there is a question mark so it is not able to accept the request which is having a ampersand sign uh, in front of it so let's see how we can resolve this issue so i'm here at my request now and uh, this is the url which we had and these are the parameters now uh, after the url we have this question mark already so let us remove this so for the first uh, parameter it's going to place the question mark and for the rest of the parameters it will be emphasis sign which we are expecting so let me run it and see the request says it has failed but it the assertion is uh, because it's expecting this text because we have changed the request now to 24 so the value of the assertion of the response has changed to 75.2 let me change this to 75.2 and run it again okay now get has passed uh, post is failing because post is having different uh, data and it's checking for both the request so we can change for post also in a moment don't worry about that so let me show you that uh, how the request looks like now let me go back to the notepad file and place this request so you can see the difference in both the request here here in the first time when we had sent the request it sent these two and in the second time when we had removed this question mark it added the question mark on itself and we had added the path till this temp value so this is how you can add the different different parameters now if i need to change any parameter then i can do it here itself rather than searching for it in the url let us see if we need to do any such change in the post request also okay so in post request we have passed the value for temperature here so this is how our post request looks like let me paste it so this is our post request so it is having temperature and from unit and to unit also here so let us try to do it in another way uh, parameterization you have already seen so what we can do here is we can pass this information in two manner either we can use it as a user defined variable and we can add this or we can put it in csv file also so let's try to put this information in csv file because user defined variable example we have already seen in this particular test suite so i want to include all the components different different components of jmeter in this one suite uh, so that you can understand uh, all the different combinations so let us add a csv data config and see how it looks like so in we will go at the top of test plan add and in the config element you can see csv data config so just drag this at the top and in csv data config we need a csv file also so let us create one csv file let me go to my jmeter in the bin folder i will be creating a, going to new and text document and let us say weather data and enter in this weather data what we are going to add is these values which are there in the notepad so let us say we are going to pass this information which is this and then we are going to pass the value for degree Fahrenheit and degree Celsius so from unit will be degree Celsius this is a delimiter as you know in which way we can pass different different variables here so let's take the third one and copy it okay so now we have three variables here 
let's save this file and let's go back to our csv data config here we will mention the file name so let me copy this file name from here file name is this one no encoding variable name now we need to pass so variable name i'm keeping as temperature celsius and fahrenheit we are just mentioning like this because this is just a variable and other bit other uh, things look fine in this delimiter is uh, comma only for us and we want to ignore the first line no we want it to be used and the recycling also as true and stop thread on uf no so we have all the parameters here now what we will do is we'll go to our post request and let us replace this with the variables which we have mentioned so uh, since this is a bit uh, smaller in text so let me go to uh, the notepad file and add this and then we can paste it in jmeter again so let us add the dollar sign and then add temperature and in this part we will add the value for second variable which is celsius and in this fahrenheit we are going to add the third variable this one let me copy this and we have pasted the request now so let us go back so our ap uh, our csv file is also ready now i'm going to check what we have passed in the csv file let us change it to same as what we have for get which is 24 and save it again now let's run it and see what we get in this let us run remove all other things and run it so we are seeing some error now let us see it says a uh, file whether data must exist and be readable so let us say extension maybe that is missing now let's run it again okay yeah that was the extension issue which we added here in the file name now let's see view results tree so i can see a green for post and get both so in the post let's see what is the response response is right request is also right whatever data had to be posted it has been fetched from the csv file and in response we have got the correct response and same way for the get request it has got correct response and the information which we wanted to get through the url it has been posted correctly using the parameters in the request which are these parameters right okay so now let's uh, scroll down this uh, listener at the bottom okay let me try to move this usually we keep the listener uh, at the end uh, whatever listener we are using we keep it at the end and here we have added the assertion you can keep assertions separate for both the thread groups all and the request also just add it as a child just drag it and add it as the child of this controller but we are using the same uh, value that's why i have kept it as this common now let us uh, do one more thing that as you can see that there are few values which are common for both so here in the get and post you can see the server name is common so we should put these type of common names in the user defined variables so let me add here server name and in this server name i'm going to paste this particular url 
and uh, over here we are going to use the parameters again so its uh, name of the parameter is server name and same thing we are going to put in soap also just make sure that this value matches with the value which we have the name which we have specified in the variables okay friends so this looks like a script which is including uh, different variables we csv file uh, two thread groups two controllers header managers and assertions and the listener finally so let me just minimize and you can see that whenever you see this kind of uh, suit you can understand that what are the different elements it is having what are the different components it's having header manager controller request and same for the other type of request so in the next class we are going to study how are the different type of loads which are put so that we can execute this particular request in different different ways so friends today we are going to execute the script which we created in different different ways uh, the way it is executed in the real time by adding some value to the thread group by changing the values of the loop parameters so all these values can be changed using the thread group so let's see how we can execute this particular script which we have created and also to in order to see the report i'm going to add in the test plan another listener and that will be summary report so we already know that our request is working fine because we got a successful get and post so i'm going to remove view results tree because it consumes a lot of memory and we will make sure that it is not executed for a very large amount of users because uh, this is a public api and we don't want it to go uh, it want uh, to crash so let's uh, run it and add the number of threads here so suppose if i want to add some users to this so if you remember that if i run it for 10 users and i have put a ramp up of 10 again then let's see in how much time will all the users ramp up we are going to keep the loop count also uh, one here let's run it so you can see in the get request it is incrementing uh, the post request is just one request and in the get request you can see that 10 users have ramped up 10 users have uh, hit the API successfully and you can see that there has been no error so as we entered that 10 users and in 10 seconds means that in 10 seconds all the 10 users will be in the system okay so let's see if I change this value to 100 so what happens I will just disable the post or uh, we can put the same value in post api let's let me put it 10 and let us keep it as 10 only okay and let's see what we get in the summary report let me remove this and run it again so you can see the difference here the post request every user is incremented incrementing in one second but in the get request because we have specified uh, ramp up period as 100 second so what it is doing is that it is taking for one user around 10 seconds to ramp up so by the time all the requests for the post request are done but for the get request it is taking around 10 seconds to execute so you can see it is so slow that it is taking time 
so this is the change which we need to do when we are uh, deciding on the thread properties that what kind of load is we are looking for here so let's complete this run and then we can move to the next type of flow another type of flow which we can do here is that you can see that the loop count so let us change this loop count also to 2 so what it will do is that 10 users in 10 seconds and then it will take 10 users again so let us see how it will run in case of loop count so now we have all the users uh, for the get and post also we can see that the average time which they are taking is 170 seconds this is millisecond 170 millisecond this is the minimum time the maximum time which is being taken by the users and this is the error percentage so all this can be inferred from the report now let's go back to the example which we were discussing for the loop count so let me change the value for this particular uh, api also and let's make it 50 now the ramp up to be 50 and the number of thread also we are going to make it 20 so now it will take 50 seconds for all the 20 users to ramp up and loop count is one for this so let's see how it looks like just run it so as you can see the post request is running 10 users are executed and now it has started again for another set of users and now 20 users are ramped up now in the get request it is taking time because what we have done is we have asked 20 users for 50 seconds so it is going to take time for every user per user the time reduces once the first user is up and running so how much time will one user take in this so let's try to see that uh, using the formula which we discussed earlier also so it is going to be ramp up divided by threads it's going to give us time per user so ramp up here is 50 and number of threads here is 20 so time per user will be 2.5 seconds 2.5 seconds for every user so now we have all the users ramped up now let us make some changes uh, in the thread group and do the reverse of this let's make it 20 users and 5 seconds so we want all the users to ramp up in 5 seconds and now let's see the report so you can see in the get request it's so speed up because now what we are doing is this formula is uh, very important because you need to see how much time one user is taking and uh, usually you will get either of this information uh, from the client that what is the number of threads that they will be uh, using for this particular application or api and what is the expected time per user and then you need to decide the ramp up based on that so you can just uh, put uh, whatever field you are aware about just put the value for that field and for the other field you can just calculate like if you know any two you can just find the third one so let's see now how we can use this so we ha we have number of threads as 20 and ramp up as 5 so ramp up i have mentioned as 5 and now we have the number of threads as 20 so here it is 20 so we can just see from the calculator yeah 
yeah so let's see 5 divided by 20 it's 0.25 seconds for every user right so it's one fourth time one fourth of a second will be taken by each user so this is how you can calculate for yourself also that how much time is being taken by every user and you can do different different variations in this particular uh, scenarios okay so now let's try one more thing let's try to fail the request and uh, change the values here that what we need to do in case of failure so this is uh, executed total number of requests which we have sent for get and post is 20 each and here we can see that there is now error in this particular scenario so now uh, the problem with summary report is that we are not able to see what is the error here because we are just seeing the percentage so what we need to do is in the file name we can just add any other file we can put it as weather api report that is okay because it is not there and let's remove it remove this data and run it again so as you can see that as we are changing the combinations uh, we are getting some errors also so this is what happens in the real time also we need to see how we can change the values to see uh, the failure because now there are 20 users and we are ramping up all of them in 5 seconds so time per user has reduced it you can see here uh, earlier we were giving a lot of time for every user but now the time has reduced so as the time reduces it adds more stress for the application because more and more users are using it so the memory usage uh, also changes okay this time it looks like it has passed And also I can see here that uh, we are seeing only 17 post requests and get requests. Okay, it's still running. And you can see like after 13 or 4 till now it was 0. Uh, till some time back it was 0 percent the per uh, value of the error. But suddenly for the uh, next users like probably after 15 users the failure is coming there is some error also so let's try to go to this file and see what is the error which we are getting let's see if it has recorded anything uh, I'm opening it so here you can see that uh, for get and post there are 200 okay uh, response code which we have got but uh, we are getting error in the summary report there okay here you can see that we can see some error so just see this so here you can see the error which says forbidden so forbidden means that we are not allowed to access the site so maybe there are some checks on the site that above this particular uh, user value or uh, thread group value or uh, any field in that uh, area we will not be able to uh, access the particular website so uh, this error is coming and hence we are seeing the failure so this is how we can analyze any kind of report in jmeter and see that how this error is coming okay so it's failing for all of these requests we are seeing the error